and we're live and boom yeah as i was saying earlier like uh you know I, i'd like to just get healthier try to get my resting heart rate down a little bit mine's at like 68 or so something like that i'd like to get that in like the 50s oh. so i'm uh messing around with some different cardiovascular uh type of training and i've been getting my blood work done um i've lost 100 pounds i want to do some jujitsu I, I think you know i'm not going to sit around and stretch a lot <laughs> i just i'm just not you know right, yeah. i know myself i know that i'm not going to do it it's it's like a lot of the people that hire you guys. They they know that they're not going to take care of their nutrition. Like they just know that they really struggle, and so they're just going to hire you. It's yeah. easier for them. And so for me, I'm thinking jujitsu. I'm thinking yoga. I'm thinking like how can I trick myself into uh, getting in positions that I normally wouldn't get into. Um, I always thought through powerlifting. I thought like if I do full range of motion lifts, squats. Uh, benches, deadlifts, rows, and shoulder presses and stuff. I thought I'd never lose my range of motion, but apparently that ain't true. <laughs> because you tighten yourself up each workout, and mm -hmm. the ty kind of stuff that you know we do in here um, is it, just any time you compete, you're taking something to the extreme. Right. No, hundred percent. Yeah, you're right too. I think I, because it's it's like a whole nother workout. It's a whole nother commitment to really get good flexibility you know that's why i never commit to myself to it either yeah. it's like I, okay and then another hour on top of my work i'm just stretching like i don't have the patience for when that. i was young i would say like uh i'd be like man that guy's such a fucking pussy you know <laughs> why doesn't why doesn't that guy compete when we're trying to do something right. you know? but now now i get it it's the people that don't compete that are actually pretty smart that's not what we really admire and that's not what we really are seeking you know we're seeking people to be stronger and more powerful and we're seeking people going to the edge kind of uh but we're also um you know there's also that other side where it's like man if you just don't compete you probably won't get hurt right you yeah. probably won't get jacked up if, if you and i are just practicing jujitsu just to simply practice it yeah like we might tweak an elbow here and there and you might so we might go a little too far but it's, it's as soon as you start to really compete Right. And uh, things start to get heated is when, you know, someone's going to twist an ankle or someone's going to end up with a pretty serious uh, injury. And that's what happened to me through, you know, through years of lifting. But, you know, my, my MMA experience uh, comes from uh, watching uh, UFC 1 and uh, just being a fan. You know, I'm just a huge fan of it. I As I mentioned to you guys before we got on air, I went to the Gracie Jiu-Jitsu Academy, uh, only trained there for about two months, so I, I don't have a ton of experience with that, but uh, also as a kid, I, I did some boxing, ended up boxing with uh, Kevin Rooney and the Catskills, <laughs> and I did do that for about a year, so I, I, I know how to throw some punches and stuff like that, but uh, just always been a huge fan of the sport. When I saw that first UFC, and you had that giant sumo wrestler get yeah. kicked in the face, I was hooked. I was like, <laughs> what is this? Because as a kid, that's all I ever heard people talk about. Like, if this if this guy in the high school who's a wrestler fought the captain of the football team, like, what would happen? <laughs> yeah, and everybody would right. be like, this guy's 240 and this guy's 240. You know, like, what would happen if these two, they're both beasts, what would happen if they faced off? And people would be like, well, the wrestler would win because he's got more skill. And the other people would be like, well, the football player, he's fucking half crazy. So I don't know who would win. <laughs> yeah. No, it's yeah. With with MMA, man, it's it's so funny because like if uh, you had somebody go against like Michael Jordan in basketball, they'd automatically be like, well, of course Michael Jordan's gonna win. But a lot of guys, as soon as they go into like a, a BJJ studio, they're like, mm -hmm. they think it's innate. Like, oh, you know what? This guy, I'm bigger than this guy. I can take him out. And then you got this one thirty five or they're flinging you around like nobody's business. It's a it's a crazy sport. And you know, like you're talking about that you got injuries like from competing at high levels. The funny thing about our sport, you know, it does look violent, and obviously you can get injured, but I think, <clears throat> speaking for both of us, we get more injured from amateurs and guys, like, when we used to, mm. you know, in the Marine Corps, we used to train... Um, white belts will fuck you up, right? Oh, yeah, they'll grab something, oh. and they're like, oh, I got a foot, and I'm just gonna jerk this sucker, you know, so... Um, it is a little different, but, uh, yeah, you know, I was never a stretcher myself. Um, but I do warm up now. I think my, my warm ups are longer than my workouts now. I got to get everything. A hundred percent. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. When I go to jujitsu, it's like, I have to get there at least 30 minutes early to warm up before the warm up Cause oh, I know I'm shit. Some, I've, uh, great. I've heard you talk a lot about finances and how it relates back to nutrition. I really like that, uh, scenario, but I've also kind of heard you speaking about, uh, almost like just just kind of being ahead like you know get, getting yourself ahead and, and something like a warm-up is something that can keep you ahead so if you have 
you know, if you work with somebody who's 21 years old and they kick the shit out of everybody they run into, sometimes that conversation of how important the warm-up is is not that easy because maybe they haven't been warming up and maybe they have been successful. How do you get some of these uh, people to buy in? I know that they're, you know, I know that they're paying you and I know that there's a, obviously they, they want to use your services, but like people sometimes aren't going to be all bought into everything. So how do you get them to kind of buy into everything? You know, that's one thing I always tell people like, uh, you know, go to a used car dealership, you know, and you, you sell something, people walk out with a car with us. It's a belief. And, you know, with um, like a lot of the guys, like you said, they're young, you know, their bodies are so proficient where they're at that they can eat a lot of junk and they're like, they're still shredded. They, mm. you know, they don't feel the ill effects, but creating those behavioral you know, patterns while you're young. So you don't have to try and revert back as you get older. And a lot of guys <clears throat> that I work with, and I told them like, Hey, you know what, as you get older, you're going to start seeing these injuries start to kind of show up. And, and sure enough, they're like, man, you know, and as guys get older, they start trying to revert and kind <clears> of <throat> learn those, those, those right. patterns, you know? So when you say, what do I do with, with MMA? I think a lot of times people, they kind of, they're like, hey, you know, you're, you're going to, you know, try and prevent injury, kind of prevent this. That's not the way to go about it. Because if somebody was truly worried about getting injured, they would probably not be in MMA in the first place, <laughs> yeah. you know? So we all I talk about is performance. Like, I can raise your performance this percentage by doing this, this, and this, you know? Mm -hmm. So I'll just start talking numbers, and that's the one thing. Is like, numbers never lie. And if they understand that, then they'll, they'll, uh, they'll, they'll buy into it. Yeah, and then also you have a, a history. You know, it's like, well, I did this with Conor McGregor. I did this with this person. I did this with that person. And uh, they're going to look at that and say, well, those are seasoned people. Those are veteran people. And they're taking care of their bodies. And they're doing uh, as much stuff as uh, as you offer that they possibly can, right? Right, right. You know, <clears throat> and it's it was a, it's been a battle. You know, like when you first start out, it's like, you know, I worked with uh, Brian Stan. It was just because we're in the Marine Corps together. And um, got him down to 185, and he's like, hey, man, I got this guy. You know, would you mind helping him out? And uh, he introduces me to John Jones. <clears throat> and I told you, I'm the worst you know, MMA guy in the world. You know, like, yeah. you, you figure I know everybody. So he introduced me. I'd never even never heard of him or anything like that. Helped him out with that, that cut. And then, you know, he told somebody. And then, you know, just kind of trickled down. Now we have 130 UFC fighters. And, Shit. Yeah, man. We, I mean, the amount of fighters we work with is it's a uh, it's insane. But um, we're building an army now. We got yeah. we're doing search and stuff like that, so people we can we can ship people out and do it all over the world. You know what I mean? We got a like a guy in London, so we don't have to go oh, out there. Cool. So yeah, it's 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 a lot of fun. And uh, like you said, like the more people we work with, the more people. It's kind of like a tipping effect. Yeah. The other thing that's helped significantly <clears throat> with that too is. I mean, un fighters come in understanding that we're going to help them make weight, which is, I mean, mm. regardless of how young you are, cutting weight is never easy. So when you're selling to somebody or talking to a young fighter about their nutrition, which, you know, like you said, they can eat junk and feel great and perform well. But when you say, listen, these things that we're, we're starting to work with you on and improve in your life, they're going to make you healthier. You're going to perform at a higher level, but they're also going to help you make your weight more efficiently and you're going to fight more efficiently. So usually immediately when you say that, people listen. It doesn't matter right. how old they are, how long they've been in the game. That's something I wanted to ask you guys right off the bat is should your job be necessary in terms of weight cut? Who? That's a heavy question. You better answer that one right, bro. Uh, Did you, you know what I mean? Right? I mean, you guys, you guys, you guys are are, are obviously uh, making money, but like, do you do you feel that maybe things should be different? Like, instead of them uh, standing on the Harley Davidson mat, maybe that should be a scale, and you weigh your ass before you get in the ring, and let's stop lying about our weight because we really don't weigh that. We weigh twelve pounds more, fifteen <clears throat> pounds more, eighteen pounds more. You know, one you know uh, one perspective is like. Uh, like a football game comes down to a guy kicking a field goal mm -hmm. and you're like, fuck this. This is stupid. Right. You're like, I don't want to the kicker who no one ever talks to. He's a nerd. People don't fucking like him. Um, and, and a fight, you know, which is like the most barbaric thing comes down to you, uh, in a sense, eating less food, uh, dehydrating yourself and ridding yourself of water. So that's kind of the question is, you know, is this whole act a little asinine in the first place, or is it just a necessary thing that we're going through with, with the way the rules are? You know, just, you know, 
looking at every uh, aspect of fighting, like everybody's trying to get that edge, you know. And you know, a lot of people are like, "Well, we'll do weigh-ins right before, right before the fight," you know. Well, wrestling has been doing that for years. Um, I went out and worked with Ohio State, like Logan Stever. This guy was a four-time All-American, yeah. and uh, he would stop drinking water four days out, just sip on water for four days. And it was crazy because scientifically, he shouldn't have been able to do what he did. <laughs> you know, that guy was a champion through and through. But he's just a nut. Oh, man. <clears throat> we did it, but, you know, we we uh, we actually started working with him. His coach was like, just listen to everything he says. And he's like, there's no way I can drink this much water and still make weight. He actually made weight two days early. Um, but the thing is, is everybody's going to do it. it. There's no stopping it. And there's so many different things that people are it like. It doesn't matter if you have two hours, 18 minutes, or 24 hours. If you People if, are going to try to cheat the system whatever way they can kind right of. and you know <clears throat> the way i look at it is like is it is it necessarily cheating the system because if i um if i go out and get a, a great jujitsu coach like back in the day it's like you're just destroying everybody with jujitsu um are you cheating the system or is like man i went out and i and i invested in myself and these guys are coming out like the 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 advantage like we have the biggest cut in um in history that recorded in california he lost 18 percent of his weight 18 percent he went out and knocked out the guy in two minutes and 40 seconds. What did he, uh, what athlete is this and what did he weigh? <clears throat> it was Drew Dober. He weighed uh, 185 pounds on Tuesday and had to weigh 155 by Friday. Oh, jeez. Yeah. And, um, so is that, is, but is that problematic for you sometimes? Do other people come in and say, I want to do what he did? Right. Well, and, and, and it, that's again it, it where depends we. depends so much, right? Oh, yeah. there's so many. Like, and it's a numbers game. It's mm. a huge number game. Like, you know, you got to look at how much, how much body fat does this individual hold? You know, like fat's hydrophobic, doesn't attach to water. So you get this guy, a lot of, a lot of people got, you know, will see like a chubby guy and they're like, oh man, that guy's got a lot of weight to cut. And it's like, bro, you can sit that guy in the sauna all day. Yeah. It ain't going to burn fat. Yeah, I remember when you and I were talking and we were talking powerlifting. I, I should kind of uh, say that out, out front is that I know that you guys have worked with uh, um, the general public as well and, and worked with famous actors and actresses and things like that. But primarily what we'll be talking about on this show um, are, are athletes probably. Uh, and so most of the time when I'm asking these guys questions, they're going to probably be answering from an MMA standpoint unless I'm more specifically change the subject over to sedentary person or powerlifting. When I was powerlifting, uh, you know, I was weighing like uh, 280 and we were talking about, you know, competing at 275. And I was like, you know, what should I weigh? And he was like, eat up, man, and he'll yeah. go, go for it. And I was like, I, I text him back, you know, a few days later. I'm like, I'm 285. He's like, this, you can keep, you know, <laughs> you can you can keep going, yeah. you know, as long as you feel good. You know, as long as you feel good, as long as you feel strong, then we will be able to, if you want to make the weight cut to 275, you're like, it's not a problem. So with some of these guys that are larger, it's easier for them to lose more weight because it may be a less of a percentage of their overall body weight. Uh, and also it really matters the shape of the person. Like if somebody's all muscle, uh, is it harder or easier to pull more weight off of them? It's, um, it's easier to cut, you know, okay. um, because muscle's 70% water. So, you know, once a, uh, gotcha. you get somebody, like, you know, let's say I start depleting their carbs, like one gram of carb holds on to three grams of water. So somebody with the amount of muscle mass that get you Get your have, pens out, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, the thing is, is you know, and that's, and that's one of the things that we do. You know, and, you know, we talk about the weight cut. And it's great. You know, we got this down to a science and we start talking all nerdy. But the most important thing is like we always say, like, if you miss weight, that's 20 percent of your purse. But if you lose a fight because you mm. came in dehydrated, you know, you, you didn't feel good. That's 50 percent of your purse. So our rehydration is even more um, in that. Like, it's, it's the most important thing to us. You know, yeah. what you are know, your thoughts <laughs> on uh, hydration testing? Um, I hate to say this, but like, like I've seen guys so dehydrated, like for wrestling matches and they pass with flying colors, you know, like how, mm. how they do it. Um, the more, I think, uh, you know, um, tests that you put on people, the more loopholes that they're going to try and kind of jump through. A lot of people were talking about like, we should have double weigh-ins, like you weigh in on Friday and then you have to weigh again on Saturday and all you can gain a certain amount of weight. What happens is you're limiting the the amount that somebody rehydrates, mm. and a lot of people will do a double cut. You know, like these are these are extreme sports. Like I bet you can tell me stories about powerlifting. Oh, yeah. like, I mean, we were already talking about oh, powerlifting uh, back in the day. Would have like a forty eight hour weigh in. Bro, guys were pulling blood out of their body and all kinds of. Cra I mean, there was crazy shit going on. That's and you know the thing. You know, forty if, pound weight cuts, bro. Thirty forty pound weight cuts. I'm Jeez. I'm dead serious. Yeah. 
Uh, it was really actually Matt Kroc was like one of the masters of it. He would sit in his car with the heat jacked up, wearing uh, you know tons and tons of clothes, and just kind of sweating it out. And uh, he had a wrestling background. So right, he yeah. so he had you know some of those old school principles. I don't know if you guys are still using some of that stuff, but uh, that's what he was doing uh, <laughs> to make weight. Oh, and every every aspect of this sport has changed so much since UFC one. Like you were talking about, you see the way that these guys they're they're finally training like athletes. But in terms of like wrestling, wrestlers are the hardest guys to work with because they have very primitive ideas. And it's like, why has everything, in terms of technique, training, methodologies, and things like that, why has everything grown? <laughs> Except like the weight cut methods, like stop eating, put us on a suit on, and you know, rock and roll. Like that's, you know, I'll talk to guys like, you know, I don't know if you, you know, you, you hear about the baths and stuff like that. Like a lot of people cut with baths now. Yeah, because it's uh, so what people will do is uh, they used to get into like something hot, right? Or steam room or something like that. And they would uh, s kind of sweat it out, right? And the idea behind getting in a bath, it's a, it's 100% precipitation, which can help you then further lose more water. What's the drawback of something like that? Well, <clears throat> the, the problem with like the baths, one thing is like blood pressure drops drastically. And a lot of guys, they like to work out and do something like right. One of our jobs is, is not to necessarily dictate everything because there's a lot of coaches, you know what I'm saying? And we have to work with the coaches, um, but give them guidelines. Like, hey, you can, you can work out and do sauna. You can do sauna and uh, bath, but you can't do a workout and bath because mm. we have something called like, the, the bar receptors in our heart, basically in the blood. If they drop too much too fast, that's when you get guys that, that they pass out. And during the during the cut, you know, we're manipulating the amount of sodium obviously that an individual has, which which basically, you know, alters the amount of aldosterone in my body, but blood pressure drops drastically. One of the mm -hmm. things that we have to do is basically override certain hormones. And doing such, like is gonna get the weight off, like get the water down. Right. But it you have to take those precautionary measures, like, okay, this is what you need to do. So if you do a bath, you have to do it the right way. And the way we used to see it, man, it's like people would just be like, okay, we're like, how hot is that? Like, I don't know. We just turn it as, as hot as it would go. And then they get their fighters in there, man. I'm like, holy. And then, like I said, you know, like we sell. That's what we do. It's like, okay, let, let's break it down in a form that you can imagine. If you came into the gym and your coach was like, start sprinting, you'd probably be like, well, you know, like that doesn't make any sense at yeah. all. So what happens, what we do is we'll put them in a bath and we, you know, <laughs> we actually take the temperature. Like they, that's the craziest thing. You're like, right. you don't take temperature, but. So we'll take the temperature, and it's it's about 105. It's a little bit hotter than a sauna. I'm sorry, a jacuzzi. Right. Once they crack, that's basically your body's, hey, I'm cooling myself off. At that point, we're able to, depending on how long it takes them to crack, uh, dictates the amount of time and the temperature that we go up to. But it's like warming the body up. You don't want to shock that body. I mean, gotcha. they're already going through enough as it is, so a long-winded answer but have you guys ever had to uh kind of backtrack i mean i'm sure there's been some trial and error have you ever had to tell somebody like hey man like uh you know i i'm sorry but we must have miscalculated a little bit like maybe something like that happened in the beginning or or have you ever said to somebody hey like remember that last weight cut we weren't able to do xyz let's come in with a different plan <clears throat> well with, with with me i know you know me and him the calculations are never off and we're like well wait a minute like how did how did somebody miss weight, right? Mm -hmm. We went in knowing they weren't going to make weight. Like, I 100% know, like, they are not going to make weight. But guess what? They're either going to do it with me there, being able to pull the plug, or they're going to be doing it with somebody else there. Like, we've, we've had people, and this is something that kind of, you know, it's a, it's a cash 22, but, like, you'll get, like, a parent calling you up. You know, you got that avid dad that's kind of living vicariously to his son. And, you know, the kid's 13 years old. He's like, you know, I want, I want to cut my son uh, 20 pounds. And you're like, dude, the kid's 13. Like, what are you trying to do? You know what I mean? Um, but you sit there and it's like that question is like, well, if I don't do it like in, in a professional manner, he's going to try and do it, you know. And there's, you know, like there are certain signs that we have to watch out for, and like, um, you know, losing feeling in the hands stuff like mm. that. just ton, tons of things that we know like okay this is this isn't safe and we you know we tell the coaches and there's a lot of times i've had to pull the plug and the coach is like no 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 they think it's like a toughness thing like oh. no, no just keep them in the bath it's like bro you're gonna start pulling water you're gonna get permanent damage mm. so in terms of calculations like we had a board up here like you break it down like barney style and it's it it's not like it's not like a well kind of maybe sort of no it's Literally, like, every single time. You guys have it down to a science. Yeah, it kind of goes back to your original question, too, about whether, uh, you know, weight cutting or what we do is a, a, you know, a necessary evil or whatever. But I think, you know, George just really hit on why it is. I mean, 
guys are going to do it regardless of whether the, we're there or not. And we've had to multiple times pull the plug and tell the fighter, absolutely, you need to stop. Right. It's getting to maybe a point just where sometimes sunset. advise people just to fight, just to stay. Like, I know that they, they're trying to have a particular craft in a particular weight class. Do you just sometimes advise them out of it a little bit and say, hey, you know, just let's just weigh less. Absolutely. Like, uh, yeah. Let's work on this in the quote unquote off season, which they probably don't really have much. But yeah, well, guys ca call all the time or contact George and I all the time about uh, moving down weight classes, moving up weight classes, where they want to fight. And, and there's been plenty of times I can think of that we've had to go to a fighter, go to a manager and just say, listen, I, I understand why you want to make that move, but w what are you losing by going mm -hmm. down? You know, sometimes it's, it, it, you hit a point of diminishing return in a weight cut where you're not going to perform up to your level. So in, uh, in powerlifting, you know, which is a way, way different sport, uh, what you're asked to do on game day is couldn't be any different probably, uh, in some sense. But what we always kind of preach here is, uh, you're not going to perform be like the, the rebound and everything. Like there's a lot of stuff that you can do. Uh, but in my opinion, you're not going to perform better by weighing less or by eating less or by taking in nest less nutrition going into a powerlifting meet. So I'm always just saying, hey, uh, why don't we worry about the weights on the bar and not worry about our weight on the scale so much? And if right. you want to be in the 242 weight class or the 220 class, uh, have that preparation surrounding, uh, you know, an, a, another time and, uh, and work on that. But I see there's so many beginning lifters that are listening to this right now and they're like, they're writing stuff down for like their weight cut, but they weigh 181 and they're trying to get to 165 and it's their first competition ever. Right. Yeah. I'm like, just, just don't, I mean, that's not a great place for you to work. It's not a great thing to worry about. It's kind of like, you know, in, in, in the book that I have, you guys, uh, if you get a chance to, to look at it, um, you'll see that there's like some fasting in there. But I tell people like, don't start off with fasting. Never start off a diet with a caloric deficit either. Get used to the food first. Right. Um, I'm not big on calories in, calories out anyway. But um, I see a lot of people that are like, all right, no carbs. And then they, they do cardio and they work, they lift weights that day. They get in two training sessions. They're all hyped up. They drink their gallon of water. And it uh, ends up being something that's not sustainable. And it's like less and less calories every day. Three days go by. They're like, I'm carb depleted. And they carb up. I heard you say something recently where you said, hey, you know, if you're not like on a diet pretty hard for about uh, 21 days or so, about three weeks worth, you got no business talking about a cheat meal. Right. No, 100 percent. Everybody feel they, they feel like right off the bat, like, you know, and go back to finances. It's like you save money all week and then you go to the bar and you're like, hey, rounds on me that you just basically threw every way, everything you saved, you know, Um you Making to, it rain, bro. <laughs> you got to save, man. You got to yeah. save, and and um, you know, there's actually a lot of science shows like you know, we have to always create a stimulus in the body. You know, like you know, with um, with lifting, like I know it's the most basic thing in the world in terms of like building muscle to you. You know, like, but people think like if I eat more protein, I'm gonna get more muscle, and I'm like you're giving it the building blocks, but you're not creating the stimulus that it's needed. You know, what's the stimulus? You need to lift heavy weights. You know, right. so in terms of like hormones, like why, why does your body respond? You know, there's a lot of women that I work with that, um, you know, they have like thyroid issues. Mm -hmm. They've been eating such low calories and like doing like an intermittent fast basically creates a stimulus and makes the, the hormones more sensitive. So right. they're more, you know, it's, it's a more effective approach. But people, they don't, um, you know, what, what happens is people kind of pick and choose what they want. Like, oh, that sounded good. And that, that sounded good. And, you know, I was I always use the, uh, the expression from uh, Voltaire. I said, you don't know the the knowledge of an individual by the answer they give you, but by the questions they ask. Right. And um, a lot of people, they'll be like, "Is peanut butter good for me? Is it bad? <laughs> is whey protein good or bad?" You know, it's like it's not. Is it is it good? Is when is it good? And like, what are your goals? What is your lifestyle? Um, you know, so it, yeah. it changes. You know, I think that makes a, a big difference. Is like what what exactly is it we're talking about? So uh, Stan Efferding is a huge fan of yours. He's been. Uh, uh, stealing, I'll just say <laughs> that way you guys can hash it out. Uh, <laughs> stealing all all your concepts now. With it. with uh, a vertical diet, you know, Stan is is basically trying to turn people into a metabolic machine where they have. Uh, he's trying to promote that they can eat more, so they have more energy. Uh, as like a lift bigger weights, and and in general, uh, it's a diet that's a little performance based uh, slash because he's a he was a power lifter bodybuilder a little bit more geared towards just lifting lifting weights throwing around some throwing around some iron uh, but what i share with people is that 
there's there's different times where you want to mess around with different things. So like uh, I heard in a podcast you mentioning about like a sumo wrestler. They'll eat like once or twice a day and they'll just eat as much as they can. Why would they do something like that? Uh, basically, I mean, you know, I always say that, you know, our body's got these negative feedback signals. And I always tell people your body doesn't have a brain and, uh, you know, people they don't understand what I mean by that. Like, yeah, it's on top of my neck. But <laughs> the truth is, is that we know that we can go to the store anytime we want. We can go buy food. We know that body doesn't know that mm. you know so there would be no reason for it to hold on to body fat you know if it knew that there'd be no reason for for it to do that if it, if uh if a fighter knew like hey if the body knew like we just got to release this water and then we're gonna go right. step on a scale and it's game over you know it doesn't know that you know mm. it's like your body's it's just this amazing survival mechanism so like we go out in the desert you know your body starts sweating out like the first thing it wants to do is it wants to cool itself off so that's the first thing it wants to do that's the first uh basic stimulus like the heat's the stimulus sweat and then what happens like oh crap now it's not getting water back in now what's more important is it cooling ourselves off or keeping from getting dehydrated so it emits <laughs> right. hormones you know so everything is based upon like going over these these negative feedback signals you know what i mean right. so right and when it comes to uh you know some of the things that i'm sharing with people i'll say hey there's going to be times where you're going to want to go through periods where you eat more and there's going to be some times where you go through some periods where you eat a little less right there's going to be some times where maybe you do uh add in some cardiovascular training training maybe there's some points uh where you kick that stuff out maybe there's points where you lift less maybe there's points where you focus in on some different things but it doesn't have to be stagnant it doesn't have to be one thing all the time and so uh, i like intermittent fasting but i don't use it all the time i don't use it every day all the time um and i you know if i'm gonna if somebody hasn't really fasted before they haven't really messed with it before you don't have to try an 18 hour fast or a 42 hour fast just just try to fast for 10 hours and see how it feels maybe you're not used to that right and a lot of these bodybuilding diets that basically promote you to be able to eat more, which can uh, then in turn uh, promote uh, more energy output. Is that kind of what you guys are promoting in, in a sense for a lot of these fighters to be able to, because they're training multiple times a day and stuff like that? Right. I mean, we basic, I mean, like we break it down to the, you know, like I said, Barney style, where you give the body what it needs, what it needs it. So if you're anaerobic, we give the body carbs. If you're aerobic, we give the body more fats. Mm. Obviously, we want to fuel the brain, so we'll give fructose and things like that throughout the day. Um, but there are those times that, like, that you say that we need to switch things up. The body becomes adapted to so many things so quickly and become resistant to so many things. Like I always talk, you know, like caffeine, you know, first time you drink a cup of coffee, you're wired. Next thing you know, you're drinking three pots and it's like you're not even feeling anything, you know. So we always got to – it's it, it's a lot of the time it's it's, it's – uh, understanding what stimulus what what's our goal what stimulus are we trying to create right. and then um and then basically creating the, the the right thing to actually you know get that stimulus rocking and rolling um but yeah i mean literally like with guys it's so freaking simple it's just like boom boom repeat you know it's like <clears throat> we use you know i was talking we we're talking earlier we use the metabolic equivalent to find the amount of calories that somebody uses during a workout now from that depending on the workout so like if i burn a thousand calories jogging or I burn a thousand calories lifting it's the same amount of calories but I have to refuel the body differently because when I'm lifting I'm using a lot more carbohydrates right. and I want to refuel carbs I don't want to refuel fat um, whereas with women women are different you know like what we talk about like their cycle like women um, you know they have the follicular phase the ovulation phase the luteal phase and like during the follicular phase they're just like guys their bodies use carbs just like a dude and mm -hmm. then it's funny because you'll get this poor this poor woman right and a lot of women don't know this because the funny thing is about aesthetics is that aesthetics in terms of marketing, it's, it's 90 percent towards women. But science and nutrition is 90 percent men. You know what I mean? It's uh, men talking to men. There's there's not one woman uh, that's uh, leading the way in, in any of this. Right. That I see. I mean, and maybe there's some that are trying, but they're just uh, not able to uh get the microphone there's there's no like kelly starette woman equivalent there's no mark bell woman equivalent there's no at least that i see like and i i feel like i'm i feel like i research the hell out of uh all this stuff and i it, it's really rare you know you have like Rhonda patrick i guess yeah who's yeah. been on uh <laughs> joe, been on joe rogan quite a bit i mean you have you have a couple of women out there uh I, I know that they're trying, but hopefully more women get into the space because I think it would help. I think yeah. it would help a lot. Oh, yeah. You know, and talking to women, nine times out of ten, I ask them, like, what phase your cycle in? And they're, 
They're like, what, yeah. do you, what do you mean? Like, yeah. What do you mean? I just had my period, and like, nah, that's not what I'm talking about, you know? But understanding that, you know, it's, uh, it's, it's important. Like, our whole science is based on time, time uh, type, timing, portion size, and hormonal responses of food. And I think a lot of people don't actually look in. I love the fact that you're not about the calories in and calories out because I think there's so many ways to dis discredit that, you know? Like, yeah. And it breaks things down, but it's like, dude, we're athletes, and we're actually, we have a goal, so, you know, it's a little bit more than that. Yeah, I mean, even just uh, something as simple as uh, eating eating a steak, you know, uh, 200 calories worth of steak is going to be too, different than 200 calories of rice. Yeah. You know, the protein that's in there, I think you mentioned that, uh, you know, 40% or so of, the, of, the, uh, of your own digestion, uh, energy output will be devoted towards breaking down that protein. Exactly. Where it's probably quite different with uh, carbohydrates and things like that. Right. And even sources of those macros too, right? Like even the type of protein. If right. you have the same example of steak versus protein from another source, how bioavailable is that? Does your body assimilate that the same way? You know, it, so a lot of that stuff isn't created equal, I don't think. People get really hung up on uh, the different advice that you guys give. You know, I, I've heard some different things over the years. I've communicated with you over the years about some different things. And you got like kefir and you have like honey. And they get kind of stuck on the actual thing that you say. You know, right. you might say, hey, uh, just in passing, you might say, yeah, I really like blackberries after a workout. And it might just be that you particularly like those. <laughs> um, do, do, you, uh, do you find that, that people sometimes are like, so hung up on the specifics and, and uh obviously if it's a weight cut situation then you like you said earlier you have it down to a science and might need to avoid certain foods uh, but in general like if you're saying hey fruit after workout probably just eat some fruit and like don't stress so much about it well, well yeah you know that, i always say like nutrition's a lot like religion you know if you say something <laughs> that you know like you know Let's say somebody's on a specific diet and that diet works for their lifestyle. They're they're gung ho and they think that everybody should be on that diet. And if you say something outside of that, yeah. you're wrong. Um, you know, and and I definitely believe that everybody um, you know has a different goal. But we always say like, there's a perfect program, and then there's a perfect program for you. If um, you know, if I write a program for you, like the actual word diet means food you eat in a habitual way. So if you hate blackberries, you know, like why on God's green earth would I give you blackberries? There's nothing habitual about that, you know. Um, and yeah, people like, like, cause I can, I can literally take something that anybody says in nutrition and mm -hmm. I can pick it apart, make it really good or make it really bad. I think a lot of people take things out of context. Right. Um, but there's never a right or wrong answer. We just say there's not a right and wrong, but there's a good and a better mm -hmm. towards that specific individual. Uh, kind of like you mentioned earlier about peanut butter, like is peanut butter bad? It's like, uh, hard to answer that question because what are you talking about when are we talking about right um what if uh it's the fighter's favorite food they love peanut butter and they just uh they just won they just won the belt right. and they're done with their fight maybe fucking eat a bunch of peanut butter right 100 <laughs> yeah and it's maybe. funny you find too the more you restrict things from people's diets that they love the, the, they're inevitably going to eat it and it's going to be something they eat to an extreme a lot of times even so if you right. tell somebody don't ever eat peanut butter eventually they're going to eat a jar of peanut butter <laughs> they're going to sit down and go I'm, I'm eating peanut butter right now so it's right at least i've found you know with different clients like the more you restrict the best things to give people are you know giving them a, a, a group or a you know a, a a category of foods that they can pick through and then you know the best food is the one you're going to eat in that category you what know? have you guys found the best thing to do with uh carbohydrates is from a perspective of somebody who is not really a fighter somebody who maybe weight trains and exercises a little bit but they're uh having trouble ever really having any control or consistency over their diet how do you guys uh utilize uh, different diet strategies for people like that like control and consistency in terms of like cravings or like eating yeah. off. Or yeah, well, like you're on a diet for two days and then you fuck up and you're on it for one day and you fuck, you know, yeah. just stuff like that. Yeah, I mean, I think there's a couple of different ways you can approach it. I mean, what you, you touched on earlier, I think, has a lot of value. And I found with, with people, not so much athletes, but maybe uh, just the everyday person creating some metabolic flexibility, getting people more fat adapted, doing ketogenic style dieting, doing some intermittent fasting and, and getting them more fat adapted to where the cravings seem to subside. I think, I think that helps for some people. Some people maybe not. The, the other thing is, is just the human factor in, in diet and nutrition, right? If somebody eats two days on a diet and then they go off the rails, what do they generally do? They stay off the rails they just say fuck this i can't do this right yeah, so not sustainable yeah yeah you know part of our job uh is to 
account for the human factor and talk to those people and say, listen, you know, this is a, your diet is what you habitually eat. This isn't, there is no, you know, we have short term goals, obviously, but the point is to lead a healthy lifestyle for the rest of your life. So I like that human factor because uh, Gunnar Peterson put up a post uh, like two days ago where it was literally just, uh, it said, uh, you know, fruits and it listed out some different fruits and it said veggies and it listed, this is handwritten. Right. Yeah. This handwritten. Uh, proteins and it listed out some different uh, lean sources of protein veggies and it listed out some veggies and and it was on, on a uh, just a piece of notebook paper took up about half the page and he said this is what somebody charged four hundred dollars for <laughs> <laughs> and so what's the human factor in that right. nothing no no if you don't get to know that individual and if you don't have a, a continued dialogue with that person I think you're kind of setting them up to fail because when you do hit those inevitable speed bumps if you're looking at it as like okay I'm trying to get to the top of that hill and I derailed so I'm just going to stay at the bottom Mm. you know that's a pretty common thing we see rather than just looking at it as a straight line you're on for the rest of your life right if you hit a speed bump or a pothole or you derail just get back on track and well it also in front of the other it also does you no good does both you no good to say hey man I told you that this is the path yeah I I I told you know what are you doing and you keep going back and forth, the best thing that you can do is listen to them and say, hey, uh, maybe we can try to go to the other side of the mountain and see if we can climb up that way. Exactly. You know, and, and uh, back to the peanut butter example, you know, if you were to look mm, at that person. <laughs> right. I love peanut butter, so I keep going back to it. But, yeah, if, you know, if somebody eats peanut butter, that's off the programming that we, you know, put in place for that person talking to them about why they did that like what was going through your head when you ate that and how can we work around that to add it back in fuck is wrong with you (laughs) yeah exactly (laughs) right and how do we unfuck that piece you know and maybe that is just integrating some things that uh can satiate some of that need for peanut butter or whatever it is you know but it's just every everybody's different every diet the best diet is the one you're going to follow the best Mm. food is the is the one that you're going to eat uh within reason obviously but you you know it's working around those things um to individualize as something that people would follow for the rest of I, their life. I try to share this a lot, and, and people, for some reason, they they always misinterpret what I'm trying to share with people. Um, a ketogenic-style diet, for me, uh, what it has done for me and a lot of the people that I have been able to help, um, it has helped a lot with food cravings. Um, it's helped me gain control over my diet. Um, and then the other thing is, through the use of intermittent fasting, it's allowed me to kind of understand hunger. I advise for anybody listening to this show right now to, to try some fasting. Try a 12-hour fast. Maybe one day try a 20, like learn, learn what it's like for your body to feel hungry. The same way that you learn what it's like to feel uncomfortable oh, yeah. when, you're at, when you're on the bottom and someone's trying to work you over in jiu-jitsu. I mean, that takes a long time to even get used to that. These guys are, are digging their knees into your stomach and your yeah. chest, and yeah. they're hitting pressure points. Like, wherever there's pressure points, like... And their that's, shoulder in your face. Yeah, they're control. doing... Yeah, yeah and the <laughs> fucking smell and sweat, their sweat dripping into yeah, your mouth yeah. and all yeah. kinds of... Uh, you got to get, <laughs> gotta get used to a lot of that. And so, like, uh, for me, intermittent fasting and cutting out carbohydrates uh, have really helped me control my diet. And that's what I've found it helped a lot of other people. So in some way, I call it, like, the fat guy diet or the fat kid <laughs> diet. You're trying to, um, in some ways... Uh, uh, you just just regain control of your nutrition and for me now I'm able to put uh, some oranges in I'm able to put some sweet potatoes in you know sure, I yeah. had a great training session last night uh, went home had some of my cranberry juice it's got the iodine it's got the potassium mm-hmm. in it and uh, I had a steak and I had a, a sweet potato with it yeah and it, you know so things that's what I think people don't understand is like I'm not trying to say that everyone needs this diet and I by no means would ever say that uh, uh, MMA fighters or crossfitters or people that have these crazy high uh, energy outputs uh, need to do a no carb diet all the time or even a low carb diet all the time and I don't even think it's good for myself so I mean that's my little my little side rant on, on that but uh, you guys um, you guys utilize, it seems like you utilize car- carbohydrates as almost like a weapon. Well, you know, it, it's funny, man. Um, in terms of carbs, like, if you look at our, our nutrition, like, 
it's actually pretty low carb, you know. Um, you, you're talking about you know uh, a higher fat diet. If you're sedentary, like we say, give the body what it needs when it needs it. If a guy is not working out, his body's primary source of fuel is going to be fat mm-hmm. in an aerobic state. So there's no reason for him to be pounding carbs. And you'll you'll ask everybody on the sun like you hear you know, that, Smokey. <laughs> 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 so, you know, if you ask somebody how many carbs they have, they'll tell you, God, they'll be like, to the, you know, hey, I've had 232 carbs, 30 of them were good. And, you know, you're like, what the hell's a good carb? What the hell's a bad carb? You know what I mean? Like, your body cannot tell the difference between a carb. Carb is a carb. It breaks they down. They all same turn way. into sugar in your body or glucose, <sighs> right? In your 100%. body. 100%. Yeah. But, um, yeah, you know, yeah. Uh, this happens to me all the time. See what happens if you get hit in the head. I, 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 forget, I lose it. Yeah, um, we were just talking about carbohydrates, and you were saying in general you're – and I, I do get that sense that your diet is uh, fairly low-carb because I primarily hear you talking about fruits, and even if you were to eat like five pieces of fruit, um, I, you know, it depends on the kind of fruit, I would guess, but that's still not an enormous amount of carbohydrates. No, um, do you guys use rice and potatoes and things like that too? No, no not actually. I don't actually do a lot of the uh, – like, Starches like I, I, like brown rice, sweet potato, stuff like that. I don't actually um, implement that um, post workout. You're big on stuff digesting really fast, right? Right. It, it, you know, if you're doing with a workout, and I think that's where a lot of people kind of mess things up. Because like if you're not if you're not uh, working out, do you need a, a a large amount of carbs? Like obviously our body's always burning um, a mixture of fuel, fats, you know, carbohydrates, but. When you're anaerobic, obviously it's burning a lot more. And, and we start doing numbers like, for instance, you get a guy your size, it's very easy for you to, to burn 800 calories. The guy is time. huge and handsome. <laughs> <laughs> you know, the, the thing with a lot of these fighters too is like, you know, it's very easy for them to burn 800 calories in a workout. And I'm yeah. like, okay, well, if you're anaerobic, how many grams of carbs would it take to, to refuel 800, uh, 800 calories? They'd have to take intake 200 grams of carbohydrates. And, you know, like most guys will have like a banana right after they're done working out. And they're like, dude, by the end, like end of the week, like, man, I feel like ass. Like my muscles, you know, like I have no strength. Yeah, that's one workout they do in a day with three workouts. If we're talking about, a, a, you know, a mixed martial artist in camp, you know what I mean? So driving those carbohydrates in quickly and getting them in the bloodstream immediately between very glycolytic workouts is mm. super important. That's, I think, kind of where you're going, right? Is right. It, it's it becomes a, a, a weapon, right, or a tool for us to, to help that athlete get the most out of every training session. Yeah, and post-workout for some of our listeners, uh, they might have uh, post-workout windows maybe only four times a week, where it sounds like some of the guys that you're working with, uh, maybe they have 20 or 15 times a week, right? right. they got so many workouts, yeah. right? Right. And it's important It's important to turn over. Uh, basically, the gist of it would be... Um, if uh, if I did a uh, if I did some jujitsu uh, right now, uh, when I get done with that, uh, carbohydrates are the fastest, uh, most convenient way for me to quote unquote recover, uh, get some energy into my system so I can get into that next workout. Right. Uh, if I ate a steak or something, I, I you know that's going to take eight hours, ten hours, something like that to yeah, takes a while. Yeah. to digest, and so I won't be able to that uh, that energy won't be available mm-hmm. to me, and it won't help replenish the glycogen stores that I probably just burnt out in the jujitsu workout as I'm going into my striking workout, and then later on that night, uh, maybe working on some gr- uh, wrestling or something like that. No, not at all. I mean, right. your body will go through gluconeogenesis, but that process takes. I mean, it's not going to be an efficient way, and so. Yeah, I mean, again, it's dependent on goals, but with a, an athlete, you know, I mean, we want the most efficient method possible. So that's why we always go with carbohydrate post workout at a, a level that a lot of people kind of look at you funny when you first start working. With what them. does that What does that look like? Po- like a post workout shake specifically, or, or yeah, post workout between... nutrition in general, uh, as it as it is, uh, you know, per. Uh... A, a fighter so depending on the actual workout itself you know like i said we'll, we'll use the metabolic equivalent find out exactly how many calories and then the intensity of that workout will dictate what percentage of those car- uh, calories are going to be from carbohydrates um you know and if you're doing two and three uh workouts a day the the rate in which you're able to replenish those carbs is, is huge um one thing that we actually use is, is caffeine there's been a lot of studies that show that caffeine will help out with the amount of glycogen that's in the body um as well as using i've talked to you about the the trans Transporters that we have, the GLUT5 and the S-GLUT1, you know, one of them is a sodium-dependent transporter, with dextrose and fructose. Using both those together, it's funny because our body can only process one gram per minute, but when you use both transporters, your body can, you can, you can process up to 2.3 grams. 
per minute. And there's been uh, some studies that have, have backed that up over the years, too. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. tons of studies. You know, every, and everything we say, you know, basically, like, you know, I, I'm a meathead, and, you know, there's no way yeah. I can come up with any of this stuff. Like, you know, right. stuff, I don't even know what the heck I'm talking about. But, uh, you know, honestly, like, you got a guy, people are like, well, what's the importance? If you have a regular guy, and they, um, you know, go and eat after uh, a workout, and they, they do one workout a day, and then they go out and eat, and their goal might be like, you know what, I just want to, just kind of want to lean out, you know, they're mm -hmm. not like, hey, I'm going to hit new PRs, and I'm trying to get to this next level, <clears throat> that's fine, you know, and that's where you, I think you say, you, you get these people that are so specific, yeah. like, I'm not going to take in 200 grams of carbs, it's like, yeah, but you're not going to burn 800 calories either, because your workout versus that professional athlete's workout, you know what right. I'm saying, so... Um, it's like, take it, like I said, everybody's a little different, but we give the body what it needs when it needs it. And, uh, it was funny. We start off with a 40, 30, 30, 40% 40 fat, 30% carbs, 30% protein at the beginning of the day. Um, and that obviously changes, uh, via workouts and things like mm -hmm. that. But, um, yeah, we're really high on the fats and the types of fats, like omega threes and omega sixes. It's real important. Let's just back it up for a second. Um, you know, we we already discussed why post workout nutrition is important to get you from one workout to the next, uh, but why is it just important in general? Well, what was that? I'm sorry. Uh, why is post workout nutrition just important in general? Let's let's just talk specifically about somebody just lifted weights. Right. You know, why is post workout nutrition, uh, and particularly post workout carbohydrates, why are they important? Right. So, you know, when, as soon as you're done working out, it's like I always, I always use the analogy of, I always use the analogy of a car. It's like you just drove that car a long, you know, long distance. The first thing you want to do is you want to, you want to refuel that car. Right. Um, and right after your workout, your, your body's insulin sensitive, you know, meaning that you're, you're going to, you're going to get a lot more for your more, a lot more bang for your buck. Gotcha. You know, we usually like, as soon as you step off that freaking mat or step out of the gym, like it should already be prepped. Um, God honest truth with our program, we want to use, uh, we actually, like, let's say you have to have for this specific workout, a hundred grams of carbs, 50 of those are going to be during the workout and 50, 50 afterwards. Um, like as soon as you get off, because number one, you're going to start refueling right away, but also like the insulin blunts cortisol levels, you know, with, with the, with the sport, obviously you're, you're going through a lot of stress. The body's got tons of stress as it is. Um, but make sure that you're, you're replenishing for the next, uh, like the next day. One thing, like when we're working with Connor, um, a lot of people don't know, it's like, man, I'm tired right now. They think, okay, if I have some carbs now that I'm going to feel it, it's like what you refueled yesterday is what's going to fuel you tomorrow, you know? And that's. We always want to make sure that our muscle glycogen is, is topped off. The All average right. American kind of goes a little overboard, but um, yeah. yeah. So, so basically, it's uh, it's almost a way of like uh, kind of almost shaking off, or, or you know, if you were uh, if you're big into video games, it's like way of get your uh, your health meter right uh, <laughs> back up, right? It's like in the green and it's fucking trembling down to the red. And uh, you restore your health by, you know, getting in some of that post-workout nutrition. Yeah, I've heard George explain it like a, a gas gauge on your car, right? Like every yeah. time you finish a workout, it's like you're on empty. So you need to refuel, especially if you have multiple training sessions a day. And, you know, that's why we use this quick digesting carbohydrates. But it, back to the average guy that's just training, you know, if you go and, and eat your carbohydrates through meals, through, you know, rice or potatoes or whatever your, your chosen carbohydrate is, you're going to slowly fill that gas tank back up for mm. your next workout. Uh, versus Conor McGregor, who's training at an extreme level multiple yeah. times a day, it needs to. We need to get that gas tank back to full, real quick, so he can go rest, get ready for the next training session. So, uh, that's where a lot of that stuff becomes valuable. It's just like George said. What what does that athlete or what does that person need in the moment at the time? You know, it's it, when is this right for me? Not is it right for me? When it comes specifically to something like fructose, there's been more and more evidence uh, showing that um, fruit in general kind of has these cofactors in it. And even potassium, a lot of people don't notice that don't know that uh, potassium kind of mimics uh, the action of insulin in a sense, uh, helping the uh, carbohydrates get to the proper cells in a way. Um, but a lot of people don't realize that uh, you know when it comes to fructose in particular, which comes from fruit, it's been bastardized because of high fructose corn syrup. Mm -hmm. right. And so people are thinking, oh, fructose. Now you see a lot of stuff labeled no fructose, and I think. Somehow, uh, as Americans, we have a way of really twisting things up, and we think that we got fat from fruit. <laughs> America loves right. an enemy, man. You know, yeah. you got us no fat, no sugar, no fructose. We love to have a, the bad guy. I've, I've noticed also people say, oh, the food pyramid's all jacked up. And it's like, uh, yeah, may, maybe. Like, maybe it's jacked up, and maybe it, it, it is. Who? What person are we talking about? You yeah, know maybe I mean? it is to, uh, you know, for for financial gain and prosperity of the farmers and, and different things like that. But um, 
somebody that follows the food pyramid even uh, strictly, I wouldn't even imagine that they would even be fat. You know, I think that uh, we have a tendency to kind of like, be, you know, think that these things are are really harmful to us. <clears throat> Meanwhile, we're not really looking at the real enemy, and the real enemy is these processed foods uh, that are at our fingertips every single day, French fries and fast food stuff and uh, Doritos and, <laughs> right. and, and all this stuff. But something like uh, fructose can be uh, digested very easily. Fruit has a lot of cofactors in it, uh, fiber and various things that, that are in it. Again, potassium uh, to help you digest those carbohydrates. Sure, and, and it slows the absorption rate as well, right? I mean, that becomes a big issue with a lot of simple carbohydrate or simple sugars. You you know, drink a sugary drink and it doesn't have the fiber associated with it. You have it by itself with no fat, and so it digest immediately it's in your bloodstream very quickly and then your body uses it and if it doesn't need it in the moment it generally stores as fat and leads to a lot of the chronic disease that we see so um on top of a number of other issues with it we're eating like a piece of fruit in its natural form our body digests that much much more efficiently in ways that i don't even think we fully understand yet right yeah and, things and it just seems to make sense from like a primal standpoint you know you're 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 walking you're hungry you're starving you haven't seen any food you haven't been able to hunt anything and there's this bright orange orange <laughs> right, on right. a fucking orange tree <laughs> yeah and you like scratch your head like an ape and you rip it down and you uh take a bite out of it you're like that's gross but the center's good right i can peel it off and eat it yeah <laughs> yeah <laughs> and, and you got Simple. some uh fuel for a little while right? right yeah man and if you believe in evolutionary biology i mean our bodies have been eating and digesting and using an orange for a very very long time versus orange drink or some shit that you buy right. at the grocery store that has an orange on it uh, you know we evolution takes a very very long time human beings haven't evolved to chill to, with the orange sorry drink. yeah I've, <laughs> he's still working on it still know. working on my orange slowly drink. i'll oh, get george I to get, eat actual food I, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. caffeine are, baby are there any common foods that you guys recommend like across the board for all your athletes or is everybody different uh, you, you can take that one, and then I'll, I'll jump. I'll be I'll piggyback off for for you. Common food. I mean, n no, nothing specifically. I mean, kind of yeah. back to what we initially talked about. At least for me, I I, I mean, it's more dependent on what the athlete enjoys. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, those our clients work so hard, and and we try to go the extra mile to make food something they enjoy, make their diet something they look forward to. So we look at what that athlete enjoys and then we look at how do we integrate that into their programming so they benefit from it and then even try to present it in a way that's attractive and we try to plate the food well i mean mm -hmm. every little thing we can do to make the experience just that much better so no i mean it, you know we stick to general staples but if you know if a fighter hates salmon i don't give them salmon you know yeah I mean, even though i find it a very beneficial source of protein and omega-3s and a, you know a list of other things if they don't enjoy it i'm not going to force feed it you know mm -hmm. yeah, i saw you uh making those delicious meals for conor mcgregor yeah um <laughs> that's the last time we had you on the podcast you were actually out there with him uh helping him get ready ready for his mayweather fight and i just kept seeing you posting these pictures of food you were making them and i was like damn i want to be in that house that looks, <laughs> yeah. everything uh looked really good what's what's the idea behind that i mean sometimes uh uh, for some of us meatheads, we're just cooking up a steak and it's on a plate by itself and it's all bloody and there's not anything to make it look fancy. Yeah, right. It looks beautiful, man. I yeah. <laughs> oh, it looks beautiful to me. Yeah. Yeah. Steak is steak. Is steak. <laughs> Um, you know, we uh, we have a saying like you eat with your eyes first. You know, a lot of times, uh, you know, you know, Connor's he's an anomaly. Like I'm really good at making a little food look like a lot. You know, mm. and he would be like, not not today, George. I know this ain't this ain't nothing in there. You know, um, but a lot of times, like you know, like I said, you eat with your eyes first. And a lot of times, when it looks good, you know, a lot of times like him. I don't know if you've ever seen him. His you know playing the food. We got a couple of people like um, that are from like Wolfgang Puck. Um, one of our guys, Eric. Uh, Trilogy. Yeah, there we go. Getting some pictures of it up right now. Yeah, yeah, that's uh, that was mine. You know, if you guys look at our, oh, we have some chef chefs on our team now that make that look just ridiculous. Um, but it helps out, and it's funny because like you look at one of his plates, it looks like artwork, and they actually slow down. And you know, we know, we know that you know guys like us, like we just start pounding the food. <laughs> it takes five minutes, and it takes a while for our our brain to register like that we're actually full. And that's why a lot of times people they tend to overeat. When they, they actually start eating slowly, um, you know, they, they enjoy the food. And then um, and also, too, like, the more flavor it has, then, you know, the, the less likely that they are going to overeat. So it, it goes back to us trying to make our, our, our clients happy in every form or fashion. Yeah, especially during the weight cut. That becomes such a uh, 
a big deal for guys I've noticed, you know, and when the food looks really nice, it's presented in a nice way, it becomes something that they look forward to, you know, it becomes more of an experience, you know, so it kind of takes a little bit of the, the stress off in the moment. Is there anything in there, um, you know, during these cuts? Is there any like, uh, I don't know, cookies or cheesecake or like, but maybe something you make out of a more natural source. Maybe it's not traditional. For me or them. Ah, uh, for them. <laughs> yeah. Okay, you're sitting there just like Dude, going. That sucks, man. You, got you look like you're really tired, man. Ooh, you, look you look like, like you're super dying. hungry. <laughs> um, you know, there's a there's a lot of people that I've I've, I've worked with that you know there's certain things that you can um, flavor it's a lot of it. You know, a lot of times it's also texture. Mm. Um, there's uh this stuff I call it. It's called bark though you make and basically you just put cocoa powder, you put uh, peanut butter, and then a little bit of water. You put right. it in, you put that thing in the in the in a uh, Tupperware that you can bend, and then you put it in the freezer. Literally, probably thirty minutes. Break it up. It's just like you know, just just like bark. You sit there and it's got a crunch, and crunch helps you feel a little bit more yeah. satiated. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, that's you know, if somebody likes chocolate, that's something right. that we can do. But maybe a little bit of fruit, maybe some heavy whipping cream on it, or some. Oh, yeah. You know, yeah. Uh, oh, we load them up with fruit. Right. You'd be shocked at how much these guys eat. Like nine times out of ten, they're sitting there like, hey, I can eat all this, because like during a weight cut, like people don't realize, like for you to lose one pound, you have to be at a deficit of thirty five hundred calories. So you got a guy that's got to lose, let's say, just just ten pounds. Like if we got a weight cut for ten pounds, I would, I don't know what I would do. But <laughs> that you'd have to be at a. Deficit. Sometimes it's almost harder to lose like small amounts of weight. Right. <laughs> yeah. yeah if, I don't know. I mean, if we if we have one guy do that, I mean, I mean, you know, and like 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 you say, or we were talking about earlier, man. It uh, some people they come in, they've already been cutting weight. You know, like that's a big difference. You know, like losing ten pounds, fully hydrated, full of carbs, and so on and so forth. But these guys, don't, you know, they, like to, to lose ten pounds, you'd have to be at a deficit of thirty five thousand mm. calories. You, you don't need that in a week anyway. So if we starved you all week, you still probably wouldn't make weight. It's all water at that point, so everything's got to be conducive to right. losing water. Mm -hmm. And that's kind of back to what you said earlier about like the more jacked the guy is, the easier it is to pull water off him. He's got uh, water in his muscles, right? Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, super easy. Can you describe water loading? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That technique. <clears throat> I've heard I've heard a lot of people talk about water loading and it's it's funny because I've heard people say like you're teaching your body how to sweat and <laughs> your body's pretty I mean that's like teaching your body how to breathe like it, it's kind of known for that um, but with uh, with the water loading the thing is like we have salt we have water and basically uh, I think it was like 440 milligrams of sodium can hold up to two pounds of water we want to get as rid as as much salt as possible problem is is once you start dropping salt too much to, or too for for too long. Um, then aldosterone is raised. Aldosterone brings sodium back in the body. Vasopressin keeps water back in the body. Yeah, your body's saying, "Hey, hey, wait a second. Yeah, exactly. Right. Blood pressures, blood pressures dropping off. Um, the bar receptors they they start signaling. Um, you know, and that's th that's things we don't want. So we usually we usually start the water load ten days out, and what we do is we overload the water on the body. So if you have you know you have salt, you have water. People are like, "Well, I'm just drinking." the sodium and then they, they basically they pee it out and they're like why do i keep doing this like i'm just reloading it up and up and the thing is is when you drink water and when we start to cut on tuesday you're drinking water but when you pee you're peeing out salt and water so it's like every time i'm, I'm loading up the water that, that sodium keeps going lower and lower and lower like so we, basically through through loading your body up with water you're able to excrete and extract more water from the body yes sir so you might weigh a little more for a little while because you might be down in a lot of water right right a hundred percent yeah it's so. not true weight guys actually do freak out quite a bit when they first do I'm that like, oh, what you happened know? i gained six pounds yeah right. and they don't trust that they you they we keep them eat, yeah. you know well into fight week drinking a significant amount of water and they see that water weight on the scammy what a gallon is eight pounds so we have guys drinking two gallons a day they're six 16 pounds up it isn't true weight but they do get a little bit nervous it, it the first time we work with people they they get scared you know and then when that water immediately drops off then yeah. we're superheroes yeah it's cra it's crazy and like with, with uh seer we we just worked with him for the very first time this last he's like i've never been this heavy before but you know in his past cuts he would drink like half half a gallon of water like two days out mm. whereas literally we up up until thursday they're drinking two gallons of water so when they start sweating it's just like holy crap i just i did one bath i lost six pounds you know mm -hmm. like the, the, the weight comes off and that's what a cut is a cut it should be like quick fast and in a hurry um so you know once again you you get past these negative feedback signals you know all week is vasopressin and then thursday it's all about the aldosterone because the blood pressure is super low um we give them a bunch of stuff for that like teas like hibiscus mm. tea even whey protein helps out with that um 
So, you know, once those hormones are, you keep those hormones, and people don't realize how much a hormones affect so many things. You right. Know? It's everything. So that's what we do. And then. That's huge. Everything you eat is going to have some sort of hormonal response. Exactly. Exactly. And that's basically what we base everything off of. Right. Yeah, it's huge. And it, it, it affects you in so many different ways. I mean, you kind of touched on it earlier when you're talking about your, your uh, ketogenic diet and doing intermittent fasting and how you're learning about true hunger. I mean, when people talk about insulin resistance all the time. People you know, commonly see that, but people never talk about leptin resistance and how much that affects your ability to know when it's full, you know, know when you're actually hungry. And right. when you're doing intermittent fasting and that style of dieting, you're, you're, you're learning to now not only do you become less insulin resistant, you become less leptin resistant and can actually feel when you're full, feel when you're hungry. And um, anyway, just no, interesting how 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 many different things hormones affect, not only within a weight cut, but in all these different styles of dieting. Nobody that I really hear commonly talks about what what are the hormonal effects of these things and why am I feeling the way I'm feeling? Well, generally, it always comes down to how it's affecting your hormones. Something I notice is that uh, whether it be... Um, their diet or whether it be training or whether it be business, um, people very rarely ask themselves, and then what? Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know? Yeah. And uh, yeah. we've seen it happen uh, with some different people that have been to this gym that have had goals. And uh, mm -hmm. they they meet that goal, and then there's they, they never had the thought of, and then what? Like, even Mike Tyson. Yeah. You know, Mike Tyson, um, I, I saw him do a stand-up comedy routine uh, in Las Vegas, and he said, my goal was to be the youngest heavyweight champion of the world. And the thing popped up on the screen behind him and it said, become the heavy, youngest heavyweight champion of the world. And a little box came up next to it and went, bing, and a big check mark came in. <laughs> yeah. And he goes, ladies and gentlemen, that was 1983. Because <laughs> he, didn't, he didn't have it. Right. And then what? Like, and then what am I going to do? Yeah. And so yeah. people set up their uh, nutrition and they're like, that's it, man. Tomorrow, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to eat this way. I'm going to eat less. I'm really going to commit to it. And then they eat less calories. And maybe they do reach some of their goal. Maybe they're like, you know, maybe they lose 20 pounds in a month or whatever it is. But then we get that question that pops up again. And then what? And right. they, they restricted themselves so much. And maybe they did so much cardio. Where can they go from here? Right. What else could they do? Work out more and continue to eat less? Yeah. Uh, then, then we end up. We end up uh, altering our body fat composition, and we end up messing up our metabolism. Right. And what you guys seem to be promoting with a lot of these guys is like uh, almost uh, the more, in, in the cases of the fighters, the more that they eat, the more of a well-oiled machine they become. Right. And they're able to consume pretty good amounts of food even even as they're cutting, it seems like. Yeah, yeah, no, and you know, it's funny, like with our nutrition program, there's a lot of people that, they, they, you know, like regular people, they start losing weight, and it's funny because when you do it in the proper way, and I love the fact that you said, you know, you're not all about just cutting the calories, you know, because I truly believe like a lot of guys, when they start, let's say they'll eat 4,000 calories a day, and it's like, oh man, it's time to start, you know, fight camp, they'll go down to 2,000, right? Well, what happens is like, once those calories are gone, those calories are gone, your body starts learning how to, to work off that caloric intake, and now what happens, you cut them too much, like by the time it's, you know, comes fight time, it's like, there's no more calories to, to get rid of, there's nothing left, you know, I want to, I always say like, put a bigger engine in the car, you know, and if you look at the physiological side of that, like people are like, that's, that's not how the body works. Well, you know, actually it does. Like if you've ever lifted, like, I know if I gave you, um, a workout and let's say you were loaded one day and then the other day you weren't, you know, you just had a bad workout. It was the same exact workout both days, but I guarantee on the day that you were popping, you burned a lot more calories. Yeah. You know? So what, what I say is like, you know, you're driving a car more cause you're getting ready for a fight. Right, but you're fueling it up less and expecting performance to increase. That's the dumbest thing in the world. It's not right. going to happen. It's going to fall out. I need to put a bigger engine in the car, and way I, what I mean by that is like if I got you know and I, you know let's say I got a 350 pound person that's like okay I'm, I'm trying to lose weight. Well, it's not like I could be like, okay, go do uh you know 50 box jumps or do you know like do a thousand yeah. squats. They, they don't have the the engine to do that. But if I got this one individual, it's like, okay, we're feeding him. And every workout, he's popping. And he's burning calories like it's going out of style. We're reloading the muscle, which puts, you know, making sure that that engine's rocking and rolling. But he is burning or she is burning that, that fat. That does take a little bit of time right? without cu cutting the calories. I think we have a, um, a lot of times we uh, will, like, undersell the value of the actual training. Right. And uh, what you just said right there is basically if we're, if we're not able to train as hard, we're losing a lot. 
Exactly. We're, you know, we're we're losing out on the on the bigger picture, and we're losing out on the stimulus also. Yeah, I mean, the whole thing is a is a big symbiotic relationship, right? I mean, nutrition is a, it, obviously a giant piece of it. Training is a huge piece of it, but also, you know, what does your sleep schedule look like? What does stress mitigation look like in your life? I mean, do you have uh, a complete picture of how to optimize the engine or create a bigger engine? Because all those things are linked together in ways that get overlooked, I think, by many people. You know, some guys really have their, their nutrition dialed in. They train like an animal, but they sleep two hours a day. And then they're not reaching goals or peaks like they, they would. And, and when you look at how that affects their hormones or how it affects the way their body's digesting food, um, you know, they're they're missing a huge piece of this overall healthy lifestyle, right? Mm. This complete picture. So, yeah, I think you're absolutely right. You know, it's a, a, all those things need to be focused on and something George and I have spent a lot of time with on our, our uh, athletes that we, we don't really talk about often. But that's a huge piece of it is having complete lifestyle that's helping you accomplish those goals and, and, and checking every box, right? Uh, not just, is my nutrition on point? Is my training good? Uh, is everything that I'm doing setting me up for success? And uh, yeah, it's a huge piece. If you're not physically with the person uh, like you were with Conor McGregor, is there some things that you ask people to do to uh, kind of... Uh, uh, bulletproof their house, uh, you know, like when you have a kid, you, you childproof your home, you know, so the kid doesn't stick his finger in an electric socket, uh, yeah. kid doesn't fall down the stairs. Are we, uh, you know, figuring out ways of uh, getting rid of the ice cream and figuring out some different strategies so that they're in an environment uh, that will promote the habits that you guys are looking for? You talking about a fighter or just a, an everyday, everyday person? Uh, let's say everyday person. Yeah, so with an everyday person, we do something called like the foundation, and um, you know me and me and uh, Dan will take a, a select group of individuals and we'll we'll basically text them or call them every single day. And what we do is we we create these behavioral changes. Um, you know, like you were talking earlier, like with the diet that you're you're on, like it's had a lot of effects on you know understanding what what full feels like. A lot of yeah. a lot of Americans don't think they're full until they're like I can't breathe. You know what I'm saying? Like it's just some people do that every meal. Bro, bro. I know. But, but so that so you have you have physiological things that like okay you're hungry because like people don't realize like hunger is created from a hormone you know what mm. I mean but also it's a th you know there and then there, you have the physiological side then you have the the psychological side you know some people like every time they watch TV they got to be eating something why yeah. is that you know they're automatically hungry there's a difference between the desire to eat and actual hunger but what we need to do is like reset those hormones when you're born you're you're literally born with like perfect biomechanics, you do perfect squats. You see a twenty-year-old do a squat for the first time; they look like a baby deer. They're like, you know yeah. what I mean? Like, <laughs> it's the craziest thing in the world. Um, but same thing. Like when my son was born, like he he'd pick out like fats and carbs, like whatever his body needed, you mm -hmm. know. And then, you know, me growing up, my mom and dad, you know, my mom was Mexican, my dad, you know, old-fashioned white guy. He's like, my mom's like, me, oh, you need everything, you know. Like she's like, you need to eat more. And my dad's like, you better finish everything on your plate. Mm -hmm. So to this day, if I got food in front of me. Like, like at a restaurant, I'll be stuffed. I'm like, I gotta, I just gotta keep going, you know. <laughs> but with the foundation, what we do is we'll basically be like, okay, like uh, day one, drink a gallon of water. Okay, did you do it? No. Okay, this is what we're gonna do. Uh, some people like it's like you know I'm a business person, so like I can't be peeing constantly in like a business meeting. Mm -hmm. So we have to attack that issue, make that diet uh, fit their lifestyle. Like one of the the biggest ones is like ghrelin, like it's a time release hormone, and. Though you like you said before, like the sumo wrestlers eat twice a day. That's basically the the average American diet. You know, like a lot of times they don't eat all day long and they get home and they're ravenous and they're like, oh my god. Yeah, two three times a day. Yeah. So the thing is, what we do is like we'll be like, okay, tonight I need you to go ahead and put a timer on your phone. So the moment that you wake up to the moment you go to sleep, I need you to put a timer every three hours. And every time that timer goes off, I need you to put something in your mouth. I don't care if it's a ho ho, a ding dong, a twizzer, whatever the hell it is. And what happens is, like, everybody's like, that's so simple. That's easy day. And then, like, next thing you know, they're like, holy crap, the timer's going off again. You know, it's like, it's not mm -hmm. as easy as they think. But the cool thing is you're starting to reset that hormone. Like, okay, you're going to start getting hungry at these times. And then we kind of move forward on and creating an environment, which is what you were talking about. It's like, we need to create an environment in your house where, you know, once you do get those cravings, we got we to gotta mitigate those those cravings and understand, like, what is it? And like, you was talking about leptin resistance. We, you know, we have the gray line, you know, things that are, what what makes my body hungry in the first place? Some people are stress eaters. Some people are like, and that, like I said, the psychological aspects as well. Mm -hmm. Once we find that, we try to mitigate them as much as possible. But then, you know, y you're never going to be able to take away yeah. all starving or all being, you know, like, man, I just, I'm just craving pizza or something. If it's in your house, you're going to do it, you know. So creating that environment is one of the, the aspects we have to that. And 
it, uh, we have, I mean, huge, uh, you know, you know uh, we have a lot of good results from it. Yeah. I heard you talking about cinnamon, uh, yeah. you know, helping a little bit with cravings and stuff. What's, uh, what's the deal with that? Basically, you know, at, uh, you know, like diabetics and all that became, you know, popular with them. Like basically like, uh, you know, insulin and, and, uh, for people that let's say they haven't eaten for a long period of time, I'll be like, Hey man, you know, like take, uh, take like a tablespoon or two of, uh, of, uh, cinnamon and put it in a, a liter of water. Mm. Um, and then also like psyllium husk because psyllium husk expands, so it, it'll kind of give you a, a, a full feeling. Oh, I gotcha. And then, yeah, the fiber, huh? Yeah. So, you know, the thing is, like, you wait, you know, wait 15 minutes because a lot of times people are actually hungry. Like, their bodies mistake thirst for hunger. They haven't drank a lot of water that day, mm. so you put down a liter of water, you have the cinnamon, you have the, the psyllium husk, you wait 15, 20 minutes. If you're still hungry, it's probably because your body needs some food, you know? Right. Um, and that's just like mitigating everything. Yeah, I've been telling people for years, you know, never shop hungry, but you also really shouldn't eat that hungry. Right. You know, I mean, in cases of like where you're messing around with some fasting, obviously at first you're going to be uh, you're gonna be pretty hungry. But even just thinking about my own day and my own things that happen. Uh, I might be here for a few hours and then I'm like, ah, oh, shit, you know, I better get home and eat. But there's stuff here that I could eat. And, uh, you know, I always have some sort of snack with me or whatever. Um, even something as simple as just eating a cheese stick uh, <laughs> or a carrot or something, just or a piece of fruit right. uh, before I head home. You, you kind of know, like, I think we think that right when we get home, we're going to eat. But a lot of times there's... Uh, you know, it still needs to be cooked or it's going to take a while. So it, it could be an hour, two hours. And now we could be talking about you just went six hours without any food. If you're specifically setting up intermittent fasting, it's different. But if it's not a planned fast, then you're kind of in trouble. Right. And, and I, even just a small snack can make a big difference. That's huge. We, we always tell people this, like, stay ahead of the hunger. Like, you're like, cheese stick. I bet you people are, like, cringing. Like, did he say eat a cheese stick? But it's like, when you eat that cheese stick, you're in control. I, mean, I always say, like, it's it's best to eat when you're not hungry. Why? Because you, you're in control of what you're eating and how much you eat. When um, you get a lot of people, they start dieting. And the first thing, they're like, well, I'm not hungry. So, you know, I'm going to go as long as I can without eating. Next thing you know, they're ravenous. And it's like, what are you craving? It's like nachos, like salty, high-fat yeah. foods. You know, your body wants those calories quick, fast, in a hurry. Um, but if you, you look at it like, okay, I have this cheese stick now. Like, man, you know, later on, you're able to be more in control of your hunger. You know, it's a lot more beneficial. Right. And a lot of people eat really fast. You know, they don't, they don't, uh, they don't take a half breath, you know, in between, in between their meals. And, and I've seen some, uh, yeah. research talk about, um, you're not able to even do much with that. You're not able to, to absorb that when you're eating that fast. Right. Yeah. No, I, you know, I know like it takes a while to feel the, the fullness of, the uh, of, uh, the food and everything that you're eating. That's why so. professional eaters, they go so at it, they go at it so fast. Yeah. They no. get three, four, five bites in like within a half second almost just so they, uh, it doesn't register. Right. They can eat more and more and more. What are some uh, some very satiating foods that you guys would recommend, you know, just for the average person? Like uh, like eating, like, snacks and stuff? Yeah, just in general. Like, somebody who's, you know, listening right now, they're right. just like, well, shit, I want to, you know, hit the grocery store after I, you know, listen to this podcast. But what, you know, what foods are going to fill me up and keep me full longer? I, you know, I typically go, like, higher fat foods, things like uh, like nuts. It's stuff that you're able to carry around all the time. Yeah. Like, you know, you talk about, like, Make fruits. it easy. Yeah, like an apple. Uh, convenience is, is probably one of the most important things. And, you you know, you hit, you hit the nail on the head earlier. You know, I always tell people that I'd rather somebody follow 10% of a diet 100% of the time than 90% of the diet 10% of the time. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? So if, if, I, if I give you this perfect program and the only thing that, you, you know, you can't do anything, but I tell another person, drink a gallon of water, and they're able to do that all year round, but that's all that they did um so you know i know there's people that are probably listening like this dude's great advice is nuts and apple but yeah like yeah if, if it's easy to carry around and it's something that is going to keep you from starving uh yeah you know, i think that's the best thing keep it simple exactly yeah yeah you know and there's easy food prep goes a really really long way and it doesn't have to be that complicated you know what i mean mm -hmm. it can be something as simple as like going to buy a couple different veggies that you like and some hummus and putting those veggies and that hummus in a tupperware <laughs> and throwing it in your car you know what i mean like it's very simple that's meal prep you know yeah. now you have a snack that's high in fiber that's satiating that's going to keep you full for a significant amount of time so um you know an apple and you get one of those things that you slam down on it and it's cut and you throw in a tupperware with some almond butter or something that you like like that's an easy way to have a snack on the go it takes 30 seconds to right. throw together on your way out the door so yeah simple stuff like that i mean is is my general go-to you know 
Yeah, whole, you go to Whole Foods, um, you go to really any grocery store now, they have kind of meal prepped foods. Oh, yeah. That are fairly healthy. Yeah. They got uh, salads, they got, uh, you know, it, they got, have a wide variety of, of different things that you can really just walk in there, grab a hold of, and, and take off. Um, there's uh, even, uh, you know, even more convenient is Starbucks. They have yeah. those protein boxes. The protein boxes, boxes it's got, yeah. It's got cheese. It's got two eggs in it. It's got a little bit of fruit. I mean, there's really not many excuses that you can come up with nowadays. You know, when I did hear you talk about the cheat is uh, uh, you were on someone's podcast and they were like, you know, they listed out, rattle off all these crazy things that they ate. Um, but for you, you like to have people typically not go, not overindulge uh, too much in uh, foods that are processed, but they can overindulge in anything else that's like normally on your list of foods, right? Right. You know, and one thing that that Leith has, has taught me over the years, like um, cooking. Like you know, it's funny we're two jarheads, and uh, back in the day we used to talk about rifles that we uh, were shooting. Now mm -hmm. we talk about freaking Tupperware that we bought, like, <laughs> and we're so excited, like, bro, I just. How to, you know, he taught me how to blanch vegetables. I was like, that is the fucking coolest thing ever, you know? And, uh, I, don't know, I, don't know I don't know what happened to us, but... Sorry, man. I, we lost our edge, man. Bro, like, I get like, stoked like, about green beans now. <laughs> like, dude, this is the best apron on the planet. Oh, you kidding me? Dude, like, and I, yeah. like, you look at me like with a serious look, like... You know, seriously. The funny but, part is, is that you you also are as excited as I exactly. am. So it's like I don't oh feel as stupid. Oh yeah, that, yeah. Picture you guy with like oven mitts on and stuff. Yes, bro. That's like, exactly. Used to be glo boxy gloves. Now dude, oven mitts. <laughs> super excited. Like we're always like, yeah. but but the thing is, is that 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 cooking is so freaking therapeutic because you're getting the senses, you're smelling things like that, and and um, like when you when you're cooking your own food, you know you you'll, you'll tend to taste it. Which believe it or not, you're slowly eating, right? Yeah. So we talked about boom boom. Next thing you know, when you're you're done with that meal you're like man i'm actually uh like i'm not starving i'm not ravenous you know and that's uh i think you know getting that in some people's head like starting to cook your own foods in terms of like the cheat like um i never liked the word cheat you know because you know and i know it sounds stupid like well why do you care so much about the verbiage because a thought process is so important when it comes to actual nutrition mm -hmm. you talked about earlier like when people feel guilty like they're like ah screw it you know like i've talked to you about the benefit like uh, like finances it's like dude if you buy something slightly out of your budget you're not like fuck it i'm just gonna go and just go into debt you know what i, I went over my budget but people like I'm just gonna mortgage my house right <laughs> they'll, 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 you know they'll have like a like a little extra piece of cake and they're like fucking cheated might as well fucking go all out you know and then they'll get like a couple large pizzas and stuff. <laughs> and so it's a thought process so like i don't want to use the word cheat um it's like your body again it's a freaking car i know i'm gonna get a lot of shit for that but your body's a car and it's like you have this this lamborghini right and it's like you know this thing's been running pretty good let's put some shitty fuel in there <laughs> you know it doesn't make any sense so, uh, you know, what I do on is that there is a reason for the cheat. Remember, like I said, we want to create this stimulus. And, like, let's say if I have been depriving my body and my body, like, you know, and I'm, I'm sure, like, you've, you've, went, di you've died it for a long, long period of time. And then after a while, it's like, dude, you just seem like you're hungry all the time. It's like <laughs> your body's like, you know what, I legitimately need, you know, th these fuels. Shift gears. Exactly. So give it what it needs. Like, listen, I, and I tell them this. I'm like, you know, certain guidelines is like, Still hit the water. Don't hit the water while you're eating. Um, and then, you know, if you want, like, sweet potato, man, have as much sweet potato as you want, you know. And I tell them, like, understand you you want to be able to get to that point where i can eat more but I'm, I'm i'm satiated right now and you give them that that capability they actually you know they don't eat as much you know it's like hey go go crazy but kind of listen to your body um and that's what we do for a load like listen to the body give them as many uh you know uh, sweet potatoes brown rice whatever the hell they want as mm -hmm. long as it's not processed it comes straight from the ground like noodles you can't you can't pull a noodle up so you know like rice beans right. things like that it's, yeah it's, it's uh it's also just easier to tell people like just don't cheat because they're they're gonna there's gonna be some error in there anyway there's right. gonna be some human error in there anyway they're gonna be sneaking some stuff here or there uh but I, in my opinion what we're really striving for is like on our worst day the worst food that we ever eat is still better than anything you're gonna eat right you know what i mean like i think that's a good that's a that's a uh that's a good uh, thing to try to take on. And maybe you're not perfect with it. But, like, on my worst day, I'm still going to exercise more than you. On my worst day, I'm still going to learn more than you. On my worst day, you know what I mean? Like, right. I think it's a good thing for all human beings to try to strive for. Otherwise, what are we talking about? Oh, 100%. You know, and a lot of times I feel like, uh, you know, like I don't even notice it, but it's like um, – I remember I, this really hit home to me one day. Somebody asked me how to, you know, I, to get to McDonald's when I was in, um, in Quantico, and I was like, 
fuck. I don't actually know how to get there. Like, you know what I'm saying? Like, and, and you really, like, people go there all the time. It was just never been an option. Like, going to Mickey D's where, you know, like, I'll, I'll go out and I'll, you know, we'll, we'll have, like, our cheats, but realize, like, wow, man, you know, like, I do have my, everybody's got their limitations. Like, okay, mm-hmm. this is, I'm not going to go past there. I'm not going to have this fried or I'm not going to have this. Like, uh, me, I won't, I won't drink anything with calories in it. Like, if I'm going to, if I'm going to get calories, I'm eating it, you know, because I, I yeah. love food. Um, but some people, they'll, they'll drink Coke. You know what I mean? Whereas, like, like you're like man you just you just pounded 300 calories you know you could have yeah. ate x y and z you know so that's that's where it's hard it's it's hard to like overly impose your will and or or not even your will but your values on somebody else i, I kind of agree with that i mean occasionally i'll put uh some cream in my coffee um you know i know i know you're big on uh drinking like kefir and some things like that and so there might be some calories from some liquid somewhere but in general uh, you're not having a soda ever. Like to me, I, when I look at that, I'm like, man, that's a complete waste. Right. You know, if I'm going to throw away some calories, it's going to be with some ice cream or pizza. <laughs> right. <laughs> but for Eat some it. people, they, you know, maybe because uh, they had the Coke when they were a child or something. For some people, they really, they, they really, really enjoy that. Right. No, you're 100%. Like, and everybody's different. Um, you know, and I think that's, that's as, uh, you know, profession, that's what our job is, is to find out, okay, what is it that, right. that you absolutely need? Um, and then basically just kind of create everything around that, you know. Sometimes, in some cases, you guys uh, go and live with people, right? Cook for them and everything. Oh yeah. <laughs> yeah, he was. I, mean, I just did it for a year for straight. A year, man. <laughs> wow. And one client for a year straight, lived with her, and um, yeah, it was it was intense, but but great. I mean, I got to learn a lot about yeah. one specific client and see the ups and downs and learn very intimately the human factor that goes into a lot of what made her tick and why she uh did things and didn't do things so Cook, you learned cooking for them uh Every take meal. them to the gym and training them and stuff too or i didn't train her she had her own trainers but okay. um but yeah i mean when we do live with fighters we yeah i mean when i live with daniel cormier i drove him to every training session trained with him when i could yeah that, you know times i wouldn't get my ass kicked too bad and, <laughs> you know uh but yeah cook every meal as soon as you finish training back to the house you know have things prep post workout that i have with me at the gym as soon as we walk in the door i'm cooking he's relaxing for the next training session eat again um but yeah it's getting there's to some, a good rhythm there's some people uh dr dre um steve jobs there's some people that I, i've heard that they just they, they wear the same shoes every day and they wear like similar clothes every day because they don't even want to make it. They don't want to make an extra decision. Yeah, that stresses them out or slows them down. Right. And food is like really stressful. Like yeah. where are we eating? Like I don't know. Yeah. Like yeah. Uh, there's and even thinking about like this place, like where we are in relation to uh, pretty healthy meals. Like we're not that close to healthy meals. So uh, you guys are taking a lot of that guesswork out. Mm-hmm. And uh, once you take a lot of that guesswork out, and there's a lot of convenience. People are just like, oh, okay, well, I'll just, what you made me is nutritious. It's what I need. It's for my goals. And you're able to rationalize, yep, you're right. That's what I should be eating. That's what I'm going to do. Mm-hmm. Did you have any problems? Was there any setbacks during uh, some of this? Because, like, there's, you know, people are, you're not, like, literally with the person uh, 24-7, right? <laughs> no, 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 not 24-7. But it, yeah, I mean, there's, there's, uh, it's funny because you do take a lot of that guesswork out, I think, right? Where it's just people, uh, oftentimes I find eat unhealthy because it's convenient, right? I mean, it's easy to go to Mickey D's and mm-hmm. go through the drive through It's harder to meal prep, you know, a couple of times a week or whatever you need. And, um, but the other thing I found that even when we're living with a client and providing every available resource to eat healthy, people will still eat outside of that. And they'll still eat uh, things that are not necessarily good for them or things that they're craving or they'll overeat. Um, and so what I found to be the, the, the most successful in helping people work through that stuff is just finding out the, the why. You know, why, why right. are you doing that? What what happened? What was going through your mind? And it's different person to person. I mean, my last client, a lot of it was like emotionally driven stuff. If she was lonely, she would want to eat this. If she was uh, stressed out from work, she'd want to eat something differently. So it was like trying to get ahead of those things, looking at her schedule and going, okay, well, in a few days, I know there's a photo shoot coming up. It's going to create a lot of stress. I know these things are going to... So it's then, you know, talking to her about it, preparing for it. And again, it just all comes down to the human factor, knowing your clients and... Uh, you know, fighters are no different. They're people too. They all have different cravings. They crave different stuff. I mean, Daniel Cormier is famous for this shit. You know, he has a <laughs> song about steak and or what is that song about cake and pie yeah, and dude, shit. Yeah. You know, dude loves sweets and all this stuff. That's so it's like getting ahead of that and talking to him about his why. I mean, his fighters' whys are easy. 
yeah. He, yeah. That guy that you're fighting. I mean, you know, you need to make this weight. You have this big, uh, you know, every fight for every fighter is the biggest fight of their life, right? The next fight is the biggest fight of their life. So, yeah, man, it's, it, there it is. is. <laughs> Look at that guy. It's uh, <laughs> try to get that guy to eat healthy. Uh, that's too much. I love him. <laughs> the first fight camp I ever did with him, I live at his house and I lived in a room. So, he, you know, he stays upstairs with his family. And I live in a room on the bottom floor with uh, where the kitchen is. And the like the second day that I was living with him, barely knew him at all. I heard something in the middle of the night and I got up and walked in the kitchen and he was in his pantry, like rifling through some of his kids junk food. And I caught him in the middle of it. it What's the rule? Eating. What's the rule, Mark? If you eat it while you're still standing at the pantry, oh, it doesn't count. Y- yeah, it doesn't count. Yeah, if you eat it in the pantry and no one sees you, but you saw him. I saw him. I yeah. totally oh, caught him, yeah. Boom, yeah. done. <laughs> yeah. He now told me he, he turned around, he was like, I knew you were the right guy for this, and he put it back and went, went to sleep. But <laughs> He still fucks with me about that to this day. What do you do? That's like seeing like a, a giant bear or something just rifling through Well, man, I mean, that's been of one of the scary... It's like, you can't... It's not like you can fuck him up. No, nope. you know, you're like... Not uh, even a little. Uh, please never mind. Please put that back yeah. if you want. Yeah, I mean, the worst with those guys is when they're cutting weight, and you got to tell them no. It's like you kind of stand with the door half shut. You "You can't do that, and you shut the door. (laughs) You know what's amazing is that it just goes to show you, uh, no matter how dedicated you are, I mean, this guy's a world champion, highly decorated um, uh, collegiate wrestler as well. Um, It just goes to show you it doesn't matter, you know, the level of dedication that you have in one area. You just can't have it everywhere. No, I mean, and I think food with everybody is a a struggle in one sense or another. Everybody has, uh, like everything else in life, right? Everybody has their their difficulties. They're all different. Um, And so, you know, George and I have spent all of our time over the last decade figuring out, okay, well, this person has this problem where have we seen this in the past what are the things that have been successful and over time uh just working with people from all walks of life and and all different difficulties found okay well this works well for this situation this works well for this and um even then sometimes people throw you curveballs so it's 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 just been this ever-evolving thing and every person's different and everybody needs something a little different so to anybody listening i would say that don't feel like you're out there on your own like oh, i'm craving pizza what the hell is wrong with me everybody has right. cravings everybody deals with those things it's just finding figuring out what your why is and then remembering those things and trying to do your best make one step forward every day and if you step off that track understand that just step back on the track it's a lifelong endeavor you know yeah i always tell people you're you're one meal away from being off your diet but you're also one meal away from being back on exactly it. right exactly right and uh when it comes to some of these cravings like ice cream and pizza and stuff i mean uh, my thought process too is like, just don't bring it into the house. You know, um, <laughs> yeah. my brother loves to go watch movies, and so when he watches the movie, he has like he has popcorn and he eats like can't he eats candy, eats like whatever kind of whatever he wants, and he sees a movie, um, I don't know, like twice a month or something. Re- the rest of the time, he's eating pretty good. Um, same thing with uh, like pizza. Like if you go somewhere where they have pizza by the slice, and you have a slice or two slices. Again, as long as you know, you're not bringing it home, you're not having that uh, readily available all the time. Um, to me, it, it's helped me quite a bit doing things like that. Um, my kids have these like ice cream sandwiches and drumsticks and these different things that they have. Uh, again, that's the uh, portion control yeah. a little bit. You know, it's like, I don't know, you ate 200 calories worth of ice cream. Like, we're, you're not going to die. You're right. not going to go to jail. Like, yeah. uh yeah, everything's everything's fine. Well, that's, that's not a, a huge deal. Where cheat meals became a, a a big issue for for me even too was, uh, you know, like I would say, okay, well on Sunday I'm gonna have a cheat meal. I'd eat clean all week, and then like that's a license to slam a large pizza by myself, you know, because I go, yeah. oh, it's a cheat meal. So I'm gonna eat this large <laughs> yeah. pizza all by myself versus what you're saying, where it's, no, no, there is no cheat meal, but I'm not putting such a restriction on myself that I'm a crazy person you know like i i uh or i'm miserable Can still be social yeah, have a drink yeah. or whatever yeah you can still enjoy your life a little bit if you want to have a slice of pizza sure and feel good about it you know versus eating a whole pizza on a cheat meal and feeling like shit for two days in training and you know uh yeah i think well we know what much. cheat meal means too it's code for cheat day yes <laughs> and it's code for cheat weekends yes because yes. oh, yes. you do it on saturday and you're like ah oh, we can you know tomorrow i'm going to a barbecue and i might as well just go all the way off it. right <laughs> hundred uh, percent. Yeah. 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 It's um. Yeah. I think after I got back from the Ultimate Fighter, I, I weighed in at one hundred and seventy pounds, and like four days later, I was two hundred and thirteen pounds. <laughs> then I was like so freaking swollen. 
I, uh, bloated, right? Oh my god, I was just, I, you know, I was calling my friends and I was actually worried, you know, like, um, I don't know, like, what's gonna, like, I, I can't stop eating, like, I literally <laughs> just can't, I had this, I had all these, like, uh, packages around me, like, fries and all this other stuff, because UFC was paying for it all, I was like, dude, I'm just gonna get everything, I had one of fudge and it's horrible, <laughs> and I'm laying on the bed and I kept closing them, and I'm like, no more, <laughs> and then, like, I'd pop it over, <laughs> like, I just gotta keep <laughs> yeah. going, dude, it was, it was disgusting. Well, but, I'll say that, uh, you know, carbs beget carbs, like, the more, it. the more that they're there, the, and, I, and I heard you uh, make a great analogy for it, um, uh, the bread that they put down at a, at a restaurant, they, they put it down on your table right when you sit down, and uh, at first, I mean, we, we kind of know, like, bread, there's nothing really wrong with bread, there's nothing really wrong with carbohydrates, it's just that we have a tendency to suck them down, and, uh, and almost not even be aware that we did that. Right. Um, and so when it comes to this bread that he put down, you're like, ah, you're pretty hungry. So at first you're like, ah, I won't have any. Then next thing you know, you, you reach for one, and then you have three, and then you ask for more. <laughs> yeah. That's all she wrote. Right? Yeah. And it's yeah. and you and you just suck down a lot of bread. Then, uh, you know, then you eat your your meal, and you had a steak and all these other things with it. That's no longer that appetizing because you just truck through a bunch of bread with butter on it and yeah. salt. And that, that tasted really good. And so you don't even eat the healthiest part of your your meal. You're not even getting in your fats and proteins from your steak. You eat about half of it. You're full. And then what do you do? You order dessert. Yeah. <laughs> well, and physiologically too, right? Your body starts craving that stuff immediately because it gets that huge dopamine hit, right? You have that, the nucleus of Cummins in your brain, right? That little spot in your brain where you're... you're body is grabbing for dopamine as soon as you eat that bread and it turns into sugar and it it starts producing dopamine and you go that was awesome i want more of that (laughs) right so then your regular meal comes and you're like fuck i don't want this right give me the ice cream or give me the dessert i want that same rush again i want that same and it just compounds like you're saying you you think about like uh these these food companies you know companies that that, uh that make things like doritos like uh the most expensive thing you can buy in most restaurants is usually a steak Right. You know, you can go to a nice restaurant, you get a hundred dollar steak, or even some places, you know, two, three hundred. I mean, it could be off the charts depending on where where you go and what you get. But if you eat a Dorito, which is like, I mean, how much is a bag of Doritos? Wait, what is it? I don't even know what it costs. It just four bucks. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh-huh. it costs like <laughs> next to nothing, right? Yeah. But even just eat one, or even just I don't know, eat eat a handful of Doritos, and and then follow that up with. The most expensive steak that you've ever had, the best tasting steak you ever had. That steak is now almost completely flavorless. <laughs> oh yeah, that, oh. those companies, foods that are out. Those they just companies demolish. are beating the shit out of us. Yeah, I mean it's an entire science de- dedicated to creating hyper palatable foods, right? I mean there's just there's an entire industry developed to make regular real whole food taste like absolute shit in comparison <laughs> you know i mean it's a uh, a dorito is almost the equivalent of putting like a, a battery on your tongue like, you ever do that as a kid yeah it just lights up every sense <laughs> it lights up every sensory thing uh, that's going on uh, on your tongue it's like a fucking party going yeah on i mean there's a whole book written about that called the dorito effect i mean there's it's it's a very real thing where your body just starts to crave that hyper palatable food and, and nothing else really lives up to it. So it's very, very difficult to then be satiated by sitting down eating something good for you. I did not know there's a book on Doritos. Dude, all right, fat boy. Like, I guess I, I didn't know it was about <laughs> eating healthy. I, re- I bought it because it's called the Dorito, Dorito effect. And I was like, I want that effect. So I'm going to read about it. <laughs> oh, because Jesse Burdick and I have stumbled upon. Uh, Doritos, a, a fair share of our Doritos in our time. <laughs> and when I was 3.30 and, and I was trying to gain weight, we found that Doritos were the fastest route. To, oh, they started gaining weight, yeah. Oh, my God. It'll get you there. It would put, it would just, it would give us, uh, like in powerlifting, it's weird because you were talking about being bloated. Right. We uh, sometimes are almost seeking that. <laughs> um, oh, okay, yeah, That yeah. bloat feeling that you have, um, you know, would be detrimental in, in MMA. I mean, it would be... Uh, you'd probably get choked out easier and faster and stuff with all that uh, ex, ex, extra... Uh, Stay out of breath right away. Yeah, extra water yeah. weight and all that fluid in, uh, kind of almost behind your eyes, that right. pressure you get. But when we <laughs> lift you know and, we have, yeah, and we have all that pressure in our fat face and, and, and through our stomach and stuff, we love it. It, it, uh, it really helps us with, uh, with training. And that's why, again, you know, people keep asking over and over again, on a keto diet, you know, do you lose strength? On just about any diet that you're on, when you start to lose weight, if you lose weight uh, pretty fast, 
uh, you're going to lose some strength, you're going to lose some leverages. And then in the absence of carbohydrates, I, I say, yeah, you're going to probably, it's, it's probably not the most optimal thing. Maybe you can, uh, but it would be more optimal to bring some carbohydrates in if strength is your main worry. Mm. If you're fat as fuck and you want to make a big change, uh, then it's probably a good idea to, to restrict the things that you keep eating over and over again that are keeping you fat, which primarily, in most cases, is carbohydrates. Right. 100%. <laughs> They're available. They're everywhere. Yeah. Oh, man, yeah, those dude. little bastards are everywhere. <laughs> too easy, too fast. Yeah. When, it, when it comes to the uh, post-workout, I know some people were probably wrote down some of the stuff that you mentioned earlier. So we have fructose and dextrose together. Uh, we get a multiplier effect. We're able to consume more carbohydrates post-workout. Um, post-workout, there's like a post-workout window that people talk about, right? Um, we don't really need protein at that time, correct? Right. You know, we usually do like BCAs. You know, anything over 10, uh, uh, 10 grams BCAs is, isn't going to have any effect on anybody. So uh, 10 grams BCAs and then also, like I said, the, the caffeine. And then if you're going to do the dextrose, it has that with uh, salt. Uh, so the amino acids are just to kind of shuttle amino acids in yeah. because the carbohydrates are shuttling into the muscles and, as well. Yeah, and I've also actually read that it, you know, uh, helps out with the synthesis of the carbohydrates mm. itself. So, you know, basically creates that, I guess, gate in the in the cell itself. So, I mean, honestly, I don't know if that's the case, but, um, right. you know, in terms of... Might adding, as well just, try any, anything and everything. Right, right. right. Um, we've had a lot of good effects. Like, you know, I, I don't do a lot of supplementation, but like BCAs, like, you know dextrose freaking you know the the reason i take protein like whey protein like an isolate again because it keeps aldosterone down but i honestly i don't take like a lot of the whey um like post-workout i think that's a big thing for yeah. people and i just um don't see the benefits of it um so we got we got fructose dextrose sometimes branch chain amino acids and caffeine all those things are working together to allow you to handle more carbohydrates post-workout. Yes, sir. Um, obviously, it depends on body weight. It depends on the style of workout. Uh, let's just say you got done with lifting, and let's just hypothetically say you weighed 200 pounds approximately. Right. Uh, what, how many carbohydrates are we talking about? So you it got, depends on the intensity of your workout, too, but... If it's 10. I mean, in general, yeah. It's let's say it's, 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 it's a 7 out of 10. If you guys got a calculator, it would be uh, intensity times 3.5 divided by kilograms in oh. body weight. Yeah, oh, go ahead. Right there we go. Tell me what to do here. All Walk right. me through. So we'll put an intensity of 10. So put 10 okay. times 3.5, which is 1 met, uh, divided by kilogram of body weight. So you're... Um, 200 divided by 2.2, right? Yeah, so we'll uh, say... Let's say 100 kilos. There you go, 100 yeah. kilos, easy day. So, so divided by 100. There you go, so mm. boom. So um, 0.35? No, 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 so you did... Did I mess um, it up? No, no, divided by the kilograms, and now divide that by, I believe, I believe it's 200. Um, it might be, multi yeah, divide by 200, and then you're going to multiply that by the duration of the actual workout. Oh, my God. So... We got ourselves in a real mathematical <laughs> yeah, see, conundrum so I here. I can do this real fast. Let's see. So George uh, starts doing math, and I immediately so, just yeah. tune him what, out. <laughs> what, do, uh, what do the carbohydrates uh, look like? Like, is it, is this food or is this liquid? What is it? Generally, we just use uh, like a dextrose powder. Um, but yeah, I mean, you can you can use real food. I think it just is going to get in your your system slower. Right. Is it? I think for the average person, that's probably not that big of an issue, though. That right there would be the amount of calories that you would consume uh, during that workout. And then at an intensity of 10, you'd want 80% of them. So you just multiply that by 80. So you're probably pulling in, you know, about 800 calories for that one workout of a level 10. So 840 calories worth of carbohydrates. Right. Basically. 100%. So, yeah, that, that equation is super simple. You just It's intensity times the 3.5. And it's multiplied by the kilograms of body weight divided right. by 200 and the duration. So it might be it might be about two hundred grams of carbohydrates. A hundred percent, yeah. And we, like I said, we take them, you know, half of them during, you know, like because as soon oh, as I got you, okay, you know, you start um, as you start working out, cortisol levels they start going up, you know, um, that insulin, you know, it'll help yeah. blunt that, and then um, maybe like once you sweat and you get through uh, your first kind of uh, main exercise or main intent of the day, I think no matter what you're training for, if you're lifting, um, there's there's always like an intent that we're gonna have. And so uh, once you're done with that first thing or two, um, 
then maybe that's when you start sipping on your uh, post-workout shake type deal? Yeah, absolutely. And I think there's a lot of studies that show, like, I don't know, you, there's something called the theory of perception. Basically, like, you know, those people that put, like, a little bit of honey on their mouth right before mm -hmm. they lift or before they wrestle. Um, basically sending signals to the body that, hey, we have that glycogen, so the body's going to be able to perform, you know, optimally. Um, sipping on something sweet while you work out as well has also been shown to kind of increase the, yeah. you know, the workout itself. Well, sometimes when it gets to be hot out, especially, that's kind of sometimes when you start to kind of bonk, too. Yeah. And you don't want to do the extra exercises. Yeah. Um, what And so uh, you mentioned uh, dextrose, but it, is there uh, like a fruit juice in there or something like that? Or how are we getting the... I mean, you can do a lot. Like I've told you before, like it doesn't sound sexy, but, uh, you know... Yeah, you mentioned Gatorade. Gatorade, yeah. man. Like it, it's, uh, I mix Gatorade and orange juice. It tastes phenomenal. Yeah, yeah. You know, and it's, you know, again, like you make your own mixture, kind of like, oh, I like drinking this. This is, this is what I want, you know, just as long as you're getting those. Yeah. Um, in terms of the mixture itself, like the dextrose and the fructose, I don't get too wrapped up, like how much fructose you're going to get, how much dextrose. Right. Does it matter, I mean, for some of the more sciencey people that are listening, you know, fructose is supposed to, uh, it, it go, to go to the liver. Does it matter at all, like, right. post-workout that that's uh, happening rather than uh, it uh, getting into our bloodstream? Yeah, I've always you know, wondered, like, as, you, uh, as you're reloading, you know, the body, like, how the, how's the body, is it, is it taking this to the liver first, yeah. is it going to the muscles first? Um, you know, and, and everything that we do, I just st I stick with the, the macros. If I'm giving the body the muscles, I truly gotcha. believe that the body... If it needs glycogen I here, see. it's going to get there. It's going to, yeah, it's going to figure, basically figure a lot exactly. of it out, of, yeah. out for us. Yeah. And then uh, when somebody gets done with their workout, are they uh, eating like fruit or are they just continuing with that uh, shake still? So that shake, as soon as they're done, an hour after they're done with their, their post-workout shake, that's when they we usually typically have them eat their first meal. Just have like a regular meal. Yeah. How about for you guys? How do you guys eat? Okay, let's not go there. <laughs> uh, I mean, and cut. Cut. Yeah. <laughs> bad. No, I, I, I think uh, for me in my day to day life, I mean, I, I, uh, I generally try to eat every three hours. I don't get too wrapped around um, like counting calories. I, I, but I do eat generally pretty high fat, pretty moderately uh, eat protein, and the only carbohydrate I ingest is generally post workout, especially if I'm going to do jujitsu in the morning and then lift in the afternoon. Um, you know, I, I really focus on trying to reload glycogen. If I'm not, if I'm going to just do jujitsu or if I know, um, like yesterday, for example, I did, uh, jujitsu before I got on the flight, but I knew I wasn't going to train today. So I didn't really do anything too drastic post-workout. I just had a meal when I got home and included some carbohydrate in that meal. Um, and I just had, uh, some rice that my son, mm. made. so I had that along with, uh, the rest of my meal. But yeah, I mean, I tried to just keep things to consistent whole food meals, stay ahead of the hunger and try not to ever cheat, ever overeat. Just try to stick with, with very basic things. Um, what do you guys think about people eating candy during their workouts? A lot of power lifters uh, started eating like Skittles and things like that <laughs> yeah. during training sessions. Um, I mean, he'll probably disagree with me on this. I'm, I'm actually for it. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. Yeah, like I said, you have that sweetness in your in your mouth, you know. Um, I think it has a lot of benefits to Maybe it. Maybe just don't get carried away with it. Yeah, I mean, if you're chowing down on a bag of Skittles during your workout, it's probably going to have some negative effects, yeah. but, you know. If you had just a handful or something, probably not a huge deal. Right. Um, it may have some advantage, too. The uh, If you're drinking, like, a large – I've had this problem before where, you know, I try to, you know, eat a certain amount of carbohydrates, like, during a training session, and it kind of starts to mess with your stomach a little bit. Little bit and yeah. you're like oh fuck like now i just drank this big old shake and your body's trying to uh your training and your body's trying to like digest something yeah it's a right. almost... bunch of blood rushing to your stomach yeah. trying to deal with it yeah yeah it's yeah. like anything more than like just gatorade or something seems to uh, be a little bit, little bit hard, you know. Right. Yeah. You know, with the like with MMA, and I know it's a little bit different for uh, like um, powerlifting. I know you guys, you know, you guys get an adrenaline rush stuff like that. But like yeah. with with fighting, you know, we have something called the enteric nervous system, which basically anytime our adrenaline goes up, you know, you, you, your body sends uh, norepinephrine. So ten percent of our metabolism comes from actually breaking foods down. Mm. Um, so it does, like blood does go to that. But what happens is because like our body's awesome, like I said, survival mechanism. Like if a bear came out here and was like. <laughs> Okay, I'm gonna either digest this food or I'm gonna haul ass from this bear. Your body's like, you know what? I'm gonna stop digesting food, right. and we're gonna. But the fact that it's still sitting in there, you know, with fighting, it's actually kind of a big thing. Like the timing before a fight, like we usually have them stop eating meals five hours before the fight. Basically, like stomach's empty, muscles still right. full, you know. Um, so in terms of like uh, powerlifting, I don't know, you know, like maybe in taking that amount of carbohydrates, even even through fluid, might be, you know, right, might might be too much. I don't know. 
Yeah, and when it comes to powerlifting, I mean, it's my belief that you just don't need enormous amounts of carbohydrates anyway. Right. You know, um, it, now if you if you did a if you did a lot of powerlifting in the beginning of the session and you did a lot more reps uh, later on, or even in your powerlifting, sometimes we switch things up and do higher reps, uh, then maybe you would need more carbohydrates. But it seemed like. Uh, almost like bodybuilding style training is where they would need a little bit more carbohydrates because they're just doing more overall work. They're doing more reps and more sets and more of everything. Plus it's also in a shorter condensed period of time because they're usually in better shape than we are. Power if there's just uh, a lot of resting going on. I guess, I guess my point is, is like, you know, you don't need 150 grams of carbs when really what you did for the day was three exercises and you did, uh, you know, a pretty, you know, pretty heavy uh, training session and it wasn't a lot of, uh, a lot of actual like real um, uh, work going on even though what you did was intense yeah it's incredibly taxing on your central nervous system right but n maybe not on the muscle as taxing system. on the muscle there's not as much micro trauma right or damage right. that you're trying to recover from I'm yeah. glad you say that because I've uh, you know I've worked with some power lifters before and it's like okay I'm trying to figure out exactly how much they're gonna take post workout and um, they'll be like well I was I worked out for two hours at a level 10 <laughs> You know, I'm like, okay, we're not going to give this guy like, 2,000 guys right. grams of freaking carbohydrates. You know what I mean? Like, like, what is your actual, like, working yeah. sets? You know, it's and it, it's a lot different. Like you said, it is extremely intense, but for, for a very short burst. Like, whereas, like, with MMA, it's, it's very easy. You know, it's like five rounds of five, you know, like yeah. you're sparring or whatever. So... Um, definitely different different sports, but you know. I think also, I'd say too, like if you haven't ever tried any of these things, uh, keep in mind that uh, it's all it all might be new to you. Uh, so don't make this gargantuan shake and think that you're going <laughs> to just all of a sudden digest it really well out right. of nowhere. Same thing with protein. You know, somebody might be like, "Man, I tried to eat more protein and I'm farting and everything else." It's <laughs> like, well. You know, it, it, you shouldn't have gone from, uh, you know, only having uh, 60 grams of protein a day to having 400. Right. You know, let's, uh, <laughs> let's, build, let's build some of this up over a long period of time. So if you're listening to this, uh, I've had a lot of success with just having about 30 grams of uh, uh, fructose and 30 grams of, um, uh, 30 grams of dextrose and 30 grams of fructose post-workout. Uh, that's always worked really well for me when I've tried some of your uh, recommendations in the past. I didn't really see that I feel that I needed uh, more, much more of that, but, uh, especially in the summertime right. when you're sweating like that. And, uh, for some reason, I don't know, I don't know if it's just me, but like, you're just kind of craving, uh, something sweet. You're right. craving like fruit. And, um, that really helped me, uh, quite a bit, you know, get, get through some monster training sessions. Hey, awesome. question over there, Andrew. Yeah. I just, I didn't want to switch gears too much, but I, you were working with Max Holloway. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, so he was deemed medically unfit or what? I don't even know exactly what happened because he was, uh, for anybody who doesn't know, he was going to substitute, uh, be a, a sub fighter, what, whatever it's called. Right. He was going to step replacement. in. A replacement. There it is. Sorry. I got all, <laughs> my mind just went all over the place. Uh, he had what, like a 48 hour notice to make weight or something crazy no, like that? No, no. He had, he had, uh, I think it was six days. You know, unfortunately, he was in Hawaii. So, you know, okay. he had an 18 hour flight. Yeah, so um, you were working with him to try to make weight, and then someone medically he wasn't cleared. Right. So do you think he might have been able to make it, or do you think that was someone else's opinion? Um. So you know, here, here's the thing. So one of the the first things when I got I got the call, you know, first thing is they, like, George, can you make the weight? Yeah. And I'm like, okay. I talked to uh, Tyler Tyler Minton, who's uh, one of the guys that uh, was working for us. Like, like I was talking about the guys we get certified. He's one of the guys we had certified, and, and we sent him out to Hawaii. And he lived with uh, Max for it was six, six weeks for his last fight to 145. So I looked at the numbers, and the thing is, last time he did a cut, uh, the numbers they didn't they didn't match up. Like last time, it was. I mean, I'm talking. Um, there's a we use the human factor and there's like a, a, a deterrence or I guess like a, like a, like a small safety net. And it's like, okay, if this guy's tough as nails, maybe we can go a little bit over mm -hmm. for an example, let's say you're drinking 16 pounds of water a day and you have 16 pounds to cut those numbers match up. Those numbers add up. Um, if you have to lose 17 pounds and you're drinking 16 pounds, that's where that like, okay, this guy's going to have to suck it up a little bit. Max is like, five pounds over and i'm like there ain't mm -hmm. nobody wait no mm -mm. Mm -hmm. and then the funny like i always love the coaches there like the coaches are in there um because you can you know for what i see like because you know you don't know them as well as the coaches coaches like you know 
they might be like, oh my God, he looks horrible, you know, but we're, we're looking at him during this cut and they're like, dude, this is the best cut we've ever seen. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm like, you know, like Tyler's sitting there like Lockhart, man. I don't, I'm like, no, it's the kid is tough as nails. You know, I just tough, tough, tough. Um, with that being said, this was an opportunity of a lifetime. He wanted it, man. He was almost like he was excited when, when he called like, like, let's do right. this, man. I can't wait to do this adventure. Right. Um, so we, we, we cut, you know, throughout the night, everything was going as planned. He was literally like on my notes, like number wise, like we had, we had a 10, uh, a 10 part cut in front of us, literally like almost to the ounce where he was supposed to be. Um, now the commission came in, the dog, mm -hmm. the commission, they came in, um, and, and in New York, it's, um, you know, MMA is not exactly, you know, popular yeah. in, in, with the commission stuff out there, but the doctor came in and, and, uh, God honest truth. If I would have saw the numbers from last time and I was the doctor, my whole purpose in life is to make sure that this fighter is safe. I would have said the same thing. And the thing is, he's only there for, you know, I, I can't be like, well, dude, no, this guy is super, super tough and he can do it. And this is a world championship fight. Right, like, right. like. He's like, you know, that's not my job. My job is to make sure that this person. So, uh, like when he called it, I wasn't gonna be like, no, let me, let, let me yeah. show you. Yeah. Um, but I will tell you, Max was, uh, he was literally singing and dancing. I got a text from, uh, from Tony. He's like, hey man, he's singing and dancing. The guy, the, the kids like sweating like crazy, and then they stopped at the jacket, and then they just, they weren't happy with the number and the amount of time that we had left. So, you know, yeah, um, they called it, but. You know, I, I wasn't mad. Like, you know, Max, obviously, he wasn't mad, you know, with us. You know, just like, hey, man. He's like, dude, you guys are, you know, like, everything we told him basically came to fruition. Mm -hmm. um, and then the commission, they just did their job. So, yeah, you know. And I know it's kind of like, I guess, like Mark had said at the beginning of the podcast, kind of cutting into your business. But do you guys think that there should be more weight classes so people don't have to cut as much? Or do you think that they'll still cut? They'll just cut yeah. differently. Yeah. Like, yeah. And that's yeah. that's the part that people don't get. Like, hey, man, we're we're not against like that. Like, it's just like, we're, we're here because, you know, these people are always going to cut weight. They're right. always going to try and find that edge. And I mean, um, like I said, we were talking about some things that you guys did back in the day. You're like, <laughs> you guys are insane. Like the stuff that yeah. you guys do, but you guys are always looking for like that much more, like, give me that edge. Yeah. So if there's 10, 10 more weight classes, people are going to cut to that next to one 10 different ways exactly. yeah i mean it's it's that people when they talk about this conversation i've heard it over and over again about more weight classes making the sport safer but the athletes that we work with i'm like if you are at 170 pounds and you know you have no chance in hell at breaking into the top 10 at 170 and that cut's still difficult and then 160 comes along you're they That's fighters the will try to make 160 yeah so you're going to have the opposite extreme coming into play. It's, it's a hard problem to solve, but I think that's why George and I and, and, and these athletes who seek out professionals like us know that part of the, the, the job we have is to find out if this is a safe cut or not. You know, I mean, it's, it, with the example with Max, we felt it was a safe cut. He was doing really well, and the yeah. commission did their job and stopped it. But we've done that exact thing without any commission stepping in. Mm -hmm. You know, and those things don't get talked about or televised or whatever, but, you know, we have to step in and, and, and make those decisions. And I think it's important for every fighter, every athlete in a weight class related sport to have somebody, a coach, a nutritionist, whatever, around who mm -hmm. can make those because most athletes and, and you know all of us included are going to push ourselves well beyond the limits of what we should so it's important to have somebody there uh, in your corner to pull the plug for yeah. you uh do you guys think it was a good move to get rid of using the iv to replenish the body personally yeah i do 100 yeah. percent. yeah 100 percent. you know what we do like our rehydration process mm -hmm. like our cutting man if you sit down like you know, like we go over the numbers and like we just came out with our system like we got a whole dvd set like telling you like <laughs> and the thing we tell everything like like you guys have an app and stuff too right yeah like fitness vt is what we put like all all the fighters like connor like connor uses it everybody uses that app you know and it tells you exactly what to eat when to eat how much to eat based on like you'll never get the same diet program you know, every day, like any day, you know, same one, you'll get a different one every single day, grocery list, you know? Um, but in terms of like the rehydration process, like our DVD said, it's like, it's like, you'd think that 90% would be the cut and then, uh, you know, 10% the reload. Mm. It's mostly all the reload because how, you know, making sure that these guys do it properly. The one thing I will tell you is like IV is kind of like the protein bar. There's not a whole lot of ways to fuck up a protein bar. You unwrap the thing, you eat the thing, it's over. Right. So, 
there's not is it is it is a protein bar the best thing for you no but it takes the guesswork out of it mm. if you know how to properly orally uh, or uh, like uh, hydrate orally um it's it's so much better especially if you have the time you know people don't understand the whole purpose behind um the the iv and you know like me and me and dan you know we did like tcac training in the marine corps military we're mm. you know combat conditioning specialists um an iv like it's like someone needs to get back in the fight quick fast and hurry you stick them in that iv put it on their shoulder and it's like rocking and rolling it's, it's for something that's quick fast and in a hurry um these guys they have 30 hours to rehydrate you know naturally the way the body um you know wants it to, to to go and and the thing is if you look at just numbers like you know, we break things down but i mean you know you get a lot of guys that take in two ivs right so mm. two ivs that's nine thousand milligrams of sodium chloride um that's eighteen thousand milligrams of sodium chloride. Like people don't realize, like what's going in their body, and then they go out and they're like, "I need soup, and I need sushi, and I need this, and this." Like, like you're like, dude, like how much the sodium, sodium you guys need, yeah. man? Um, you know, they they don't understand that there's got to be a balance. You know, like sodium, potassium, magnesium, like these electrolytes, yeah. and they, they're not getting that in the in the IVs. Whereas when we give them these shakes, they got that perfect combination di um, dictated by by their actual cut. Could be really dangerous, you know, having that, you know, large amounts of sodium and not enough potassium, or uh, maybe somebody not knowing what they're doing and they take in large amounts of potassium. Um, there's there's all kinds of things that can happen to you. But uh, when you're gaining this weight back, you can also like if you just go hog wild and hit buffets and and eat a lot of sodium, you I'd imagine your blood sh your uh, blood pressure goes from being pretty low. Where you know people when they're weighing in, they 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 look sickly almost, they look a little whitish, and then boom, your blood pressure could be spiked, and you could pass out. I mean, there's a lot of things that can happen, right? Right. No, absolutely. You know, <clears throat> and it's like at the end of the day, we all say a three percent dehydration equates up to thirty percent decrease in performance. You're three percent dehydrated, you might be walking in there as a seven percent fighter. Um, you know, we, we, we monitor and make sure that everything that goes in these shakes, everything that goes in their mouth, because the funny thing is, is a fighter is a fighter is a fighter. It's like, as soon as they're done, uh, they start drinking a little bit of water. They just want to eat. They just want to pound, you know? And it's like, you got to save them from themselves. Like, Hey man, <laughs> we got to get some water in you before you start eating, you know, yeah. eating that food. Um, and you know, it, as dangerous as you know you think you know in terms of like uh blood pressure these guys their blood pressure is so low like you know it, it would take you know a considerable amount of time and, and mm. for them to continue, uh, continue to do that but you imagine if you got this guy he stuffs himself and i would say it's like an upside down filter right with these guys they freaking plug that filter up their body wants it but it's like dude i yeah. can't eat because it can't digest those, that food they end up eating like once or twice mm. um you know i've had that happen you weigh in and you're all excited and you you eat you know, any and everything, and then uh, you're just like gassy and stuff, and you can't you can't really consume the food that you wanted to consume. Did you? It's your body needs absolutely. It just can't break it down that fast. Can you put more weight on somebody than uh, what they originally weighed? Right. So what we do is we we actually we have a formula to find out exactly how much glycogen your body holds, basically in your liver and your muscle, right? And we get we like you know for for example you have to stop eating five hours before your fight and then obviously you're not going to be eating while you sleep so we get the amount of time okay this is the amount of eating time that this person's going to have this is the amount of meals that this individual is going to eat maybe six seven or eight meals and then let's say like you know someone like you i, I i'm guessing your body would probably hold 450 to 500 grams of carbohydrates so what we do is we break that down into six seven or eight meals mm -hmm. and then that's that's what we get to make sure and it'll bring you back up to the start of the cut so whatever they show up on tuesday that's typically what you're going to be fighting at on saturday and the big problem that we have is like a lot of guys, they almost took it as like a sense of pride, like like a goal, like oh, let's see how big I can get. Yeah, you know? yeah. And it's like, dude, you're ten pounds heavier than you were on Tuesday. Like, how do you think that's gonna help you in any form or fashion? You know, it's just they're gonna be slow, sluggish, yeah. and lethargic. It's hard to rationalize it. You know, you're competing, and I think we we tend to get nervous. Yeah. You know, and then we start to think, oh shit, that guy that I'm in there with is a real beast. He's real strong. Right. You know, I better weigh 180 when the plan was for me to weigh 170. Right. You 100%. Know? Yeah. You probably see a lot of guys uh, doing that, you know, going a little a little overboard. Yeah. Like uh, his name was like Glacen T Bow. Dude, yeah. That guy would go nuts with the weight cuts. Yeah. The dude was humongous. Yeah. Glacen's <laughs> huge. Yeah. I was like, holy crap. When I saw him, like I saw him in person, I was like, you got to be kidding. Like, this guy's a 50. He's like, he's my size, man. Like, yeah. There's a couple of guys like that out there. You walk, you see these guys backstage, and like, how I, 
yeah. doing this every day, I still look at oh. guys and go, that's, that's too much. Dude, Max Holloway, like, even, man, like, when I saw Max for the first time before we started working with him, and he was, like, he was, like, 190 something. Mm-hmm. He's just this big dude. I was, like. Dude, Vic is the biggest 55 oh, I've ever seen in my dude, life. Vic's my boy. Fucking love Vic. But man, he's Vic, shredded. He makes me work for my money. I tell you that. <laughs> every time we show up, it's going to be a, it's going to be a, a story to tell. Yeah, look at that guy. What was it like uh, prepping all those meals for Conor McGregor and being part of that whole just team? Dude, it was it was surreal, man. You know what the craziest thing is, is uh, so his client, you know, Demi was singing at the uh, at the fight. And mm. I was, so yeah, she sang the national anthem at the fight. Yeah, it was cool. That's cool. Yeah. It was nuts, man. You know, so we got two jarheads, man. That like we started <laughs> off with a dream back in the day, and the next thing you know, we're sitting in the the T-Mobile Arena in Vegas, backstage in Conor McGregor's you know corner uh, room. Kind of like, dude, you know, your client's singing the national anthem tonight, and my client's going to be part of one of the biggest fights in history. It is, uh, you know, it is, it's a few things in your life. You know, like, this is going to be history. You know, yeah. like, you see those pictures of, like, George Foreman and all these other things, like, back in the day, those boxers, just like. Yeah, the rumble in the jungle. This yeah. is it, man. There's going to be pictures like that. So it was it was awesome. It was yeah, and uh, going to, uh, you know, some of those different, he kept popping around these different uh, countries, like, for the that world tour for that yeah. fight. That seemed crazy, and they'd get up there and they'd talk shit about each other, and uh, it was that was uh, that was amazing. Did you end up going to some of those things? Too? I was at every one. If you see me, I'm the I'm the guy in the corner with the lunchbox. Like literally had a lunchbox, <laughs> and like Connor is like he's like uh, he's all about his boys, all about loyalty, yeah. and then freaking uh, Mayweather's guys started talking smack, and I'm sitting there like man, like I mean. I'm a professional. I can't. I can't be getting in fights. But, <laughs> but I don't want like Connor be like, dude, you didn't have my back. So I'm like, all right, man. So the next thing I know, like all of them started coming together, and I'm over here with his lunch. Like can't fuck up the food, trying to like push people back. <laughs> other, man, man. And it's just like, oh, this is this is ridiculous. But I mean, dude, it's it's it was such just like going in like the like the private jets and stuff like that. And then I flew home. I flew home, coach, after the fight. You know. And I'm like, where's my fucking blanket and my <laughs> salmon? You know, I, you know, my booties. What the hell? You know, but uh, it was a it was a hell of an experience, man. Yeah, it looked like. I mean, I can't even imagine. You must be uh, just absolutely mobbed uh, everywhere you guys went. It must have been uh, pretty crazy. Do you have a role when it comes to that too, or does he just have like regular security? No, yeah, yeah. Um, you know, I I'm just a food guy, but they gotcha. always the cool thing is like, you know, we have a background. Like, you know, I fought uh, for 15 years. Me yeah, and you need to bump somebody out of the way for him. It's no big deal. 100. Right? Like, yeah. boom, they they call me Steven Seagal because like, you know, he was the, <laughs> in under siege. He was the cook. Yeah, they're like, you like, yeah, and I'm like, you know, I, you know, I'm not a big fan of Steven Seagal, but it was kind of cool. <laughs> you're like, dude, that's he was the cook, and uh, you know, he was actually kind of badass. But uh, I'm just a food dude. That's uh, that's uh, that's pretty cool. What did you learn from that experience? Like in terms of. Uh, kind of like the human element as he was talking about earlier um and just seeing like uh you know Conor McGregor is the champion he's like he's one of the best what have you learned by kind of uh rubbing elbows and seeing these guys first uh firsthand I mean um there, there's there's so many aspects to that team like uh you know like John Cavanaugh he's he's one of the best coaches in the world for a reason he's a he's a mentor to all these guys and it was it was cool because we stayed at so there was basically three houses. You had the sparring house, you had the the fighter house, and then you had Connor, you know, for his family. Um, and I got to hang out, you know, I was you know with Artem and Colin and like everybody, and it's just a, uh, you know, like just crazy the personalities in that group, dude. I can't even I can't even begin to tell you, but you see, like Connor's, he's one of the few guys that had the the team. From the beginning, same exact friends, same exact team, everything, you know, like loyalty is a, is a real big thing to him, but he picks his people very wisely. Mm-hmm. Like, it's not just like, oh, we're going to be loyal to you. It's like he's loyal after he picks you. And like, you know, when we first started working together, uh, it was for the Jose Aldo fight. Mm-hmm. And um, it's like, okay, they took their time to pick me. And then everything I said is like, boom, done deal, you know. But um, his coach, like I said, he's, he's a great mentor. Um, Connor, the thing about it is uh, he was more calm, like, the entire time. Like, I'm, I'm sitting there like, this is this is going to be, like, televised everywhere. Yeah. And I, I'm like, he's just sitting there, like, calm. Like, he'd be eating dinner at night. And he's like, you know, I remember, I'll never forget this. He, like, he was talking to me, and he was just like, he's like, dude, I honestly think this is going to be an easy one. And I was like oh my goodness, like, this is going to happen. Like, I think, I really believe, and I, dude, and like, when people say, like, I understand where the level of Mayweather, it's just yeah. like, this guy is constantly just kind of defying the odds and things like that. And I, you know, I mean, he went 10 rounds with the, the greatest, you know, for his first boxing match. Um, but that mentality mm. and that, that, um, 
uh, I guess, confidence. You know, it, it was cool to see. It's a really cool video going around. It's on YouTube. It's uh, it's about stoicism, and it's, it talks about Conor McGregor, and he's got like these seven things or ten things or whatever. Somebody put a compilation together and they talked about how he'd said something in the press and he was pissed and he's like i don't want to fucking be here you know 10 days earlier what like he was just frustrated like you know right. all the fighters get frustrated they got yeah. press stuff to do uh they're trying to make weight there's a lot on their mind and all they want to do is concentrate on the fight so he complained once boom got it out of his system then he got tried to get baited back into that in a in a conversation where somebody just interviewed him on the street and Boom, his mind changed just like that because he's just brushing it right off his shoulder. Like, well, you know, how do you feel about being here? He's like, actually, wherever, whatever city was in or whatever, he just like, you, know, you could tell he kind of just made it up, but he's he's talking himself into believing it. He's right. like the city of Detroit or wherever the hell they are. <laughs> he's like, I absolutely love it. You know, it's actually it's actually good to be here a couple days early. He's like, my whole team comes with me. I get to prep my, you know, I get my food and I get everything all situated. And it's kind of nice being here a little bit early, which he just totally diffused the situation. Yeah. Whereas he would have went back on that rampage again. He would have uh, let himself down a stressful road. And as a champion, you can't have that kind of stress around you. Right. So it's no surprise he's uh, cooler than the other side of a pillow when it comes to uh, when it comes to the situations like that. <laughs> he's so witty too. Like it blows my mind how witty this guy is. Like I'm like he probably Where? likes to have fun, right? Oh my goodness, yeah. But yeah, like when he started, <clears throat> he didn't know that he was actually going to get the mic when uh, him and uh, Mayweather. Nobody <laughs> told him. So they just like basically, you know, Dana was like you know, raining, defending, and there you go. Dude, like without even skipping a beat, was like boom, just like and just started yeah. going, and you know, um, and then you know Mayweather started talking smack. I don't know if you guys saw the one in, in Canada. May, uh, Connor was like, "I love that stuff. It's it, so good, bro." He's like, "Not again." He's like, "Never again." I'm not, no. Nah. So he like literally, I mean, he was just talking with us the entire time, stuff like that on the flight. You wouldn't even think that he was thinking of anything. He went out there, and I was like, "Oh man, that was." That was nasty. Like, I mean, so the guy's witty, he's smart in so many ways. So. Yeah, Mayweather had that uh, briefcase full of money. It was like, it, there was like a, a $10,000 in there yeah. or something. He was making fun of him. Like, yeah, he's, he's like, like, that's it. That's yeah, all he's like, 10000 bucks. He's <laughs> oh, like, come dude. on, bro. The, 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 the comment about these, like, you're dressed like a schoolboy with your little backpack and you can't even read. I was like, God. <laughs> this is it just, yeah, they didn't hold anything back. I'll tell you that. <laughs> yeah, he, he's he i remember yeah he's pulling all the money out of the backpack and stuff it seemed like a couple times they were really gonna fight you think they were just playing with each other you Man, think it got it got I a little heated one of these, this my, i don't know which one is this so, I, think, I, I, I just pulled up canada and it said it was in toronto so i don't know if this is the one that you were talking so it about became like a rap battle. no that I, this, <laughs> this one uh, this one i think is new york Okay, it might just be like a compilation. Oh, wait, no, no. Yeah, there's the bag. I was going to say, one of them might be the first one. But yeah, you'll see me in the little lunchbox in here too, guys. My little two seconds oh, of yeah. fame. No. <laughs> but uh, yeah, I'm usually the guy in the corner. And like, hey, man, it was funny because I'm like, dude's got to eat, dude's got to eat, dude's got to eat. And like, when he's going through this, obviously, you know, like he's getting such a rush. I mean, there's so many freaking people, thousands of freaking people. He's not hungry, but... You know, I'm like falling around with lunchbox. Like, you, you ready now? You ready now? It's, it's, uh... <laughs> I love how he's just even sitting there, like even just sitting there, like uh, you know, in his suit and everything, just just chomping on that gum the whole time. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> like looking like he doesn't give a shit, right? <laughs> Man, yeah. This is, um, from what I remember, like it was like I think one of the first ones where Connor's mic like just oh. magically stopped working or whatever. But so I don't know if that was staged or whatnot. But then afterwards, Mayweather said he was upset because it kind of yeah it fucked up the fight or whatever. It was this one. It was Dude, this one. You want you want to know th which one this was? This is the, the the very first one. So I got separated from the group, right? <laughs> So they put all of Connor's guy on one side, and then they put me on the other side. And I turn around, and there was nothing but freaking Mayweather guys around me. And I'm like, "Oh hell!" Like, <laughs> and they started talking. Like, Whoops. Oh, they started talking smack. They're like, "He's one of them." And I'm like, "Man, I don't." I don't know. Like, Shit. Yeah, those guys will fight you, right? Oh, you know, you know, pops is looking to uh, unload on somebody. Probably. I went that week to uh, Mayweather's gym with Demi to watch his uh, workout, and I mean. At one point, Demi's manager looked over at me and was like, you should probably leave. And I turned oh, around, shit. and there was like eight guys pointing at me and talking. And I was like, okay, I'm going to go. <laughs> yeah, Everything I ever heard about Mayweather is that he works his ass off. Yeah. You know, he's got this uh, this perception of being like, uh, 
you know, very over the top. You know, he's got his uh, carts of money being unloaded from his van. You ever see that? Like, uh, they they oh, take yeah. they take out stacks of cash and they put it on like a cart and they like wheel it across. He does all kinds of uh, crazy weird stuff to, uh, you know, get attention in the media and different things like that. But from everything I've ever heard about him, is like he's he's one of the hard hard working guys out there, and you know he's just been dominant as a boxer oh yeah i mean you couldn't get to where he's at without that like I mean, you're right everybody's told me that like um and i think the guy i mean he's just he's crazy smart you know he's super intelligent you know with what, what he does <laughs> a lot of things you know, yeah. can, can you mimic that walk for us after being around him for that many weeks that conor mcgregor oh, walk man. you know it's funny i can't i can't mimic the damn irish accent i'm always but when i'm when i'm in ireland for like six weeks yeah. i can do it perfectly and then That's i come great. back to the states and it's like and you're all you're all screwed up again yeah, all, look at this guy man oh that, my god that freaking walk, I, but all to me, all that's uh, you know, all of that's a very big part of it. How you feel, yeah, you know, and uh, convincing your mind that you can, uh, you can do it. I think a lot of people learned a lot from Conor McGregor, and you know, the the fight, uh, Mayweather never really looked like he was in trouble, but to be able to do anything against uh, Mayweather, who's you know, arguably the greatest fighter of all time, greatest boxer of all time. Yeah. Uh, that was just, it was ridiculous. Yeah, really relief's cool. a powerful thing, man. It's unbelievable oh. what he did with that. You know, it was great. That one right there was Toronto. That's, uh, that's it right how there. How do you, how do you manage, you know, sleep, you know, with these, with these fights and this kind of traveling, um, and, and dealing with other, other fighters that you guys have dealt with over the years, um, how, how are we, how are we making sure that we're, we're getting enough sleep and then what is enough sleep for some of these guys? Oh, for, for him, I mean, like, on a private jet, like, we'd make sure, like, you know, he'd sleep in the back. they just, they'd block everything off. He'd go pass out, you know, because, like, when we, the very first flight, we flew from Ireland to... Uh, Is that, like, a discussion that you have to have with, with somebody like him or, or some of these other guys? Like, you know, hey, man, like... Yeah. Now would be a good time. Like, let's put your phone away. Or is he professional enough to be like, oh, I'm, I'm, hey guys, I need to sleep. You know, the funny thing is, is he's, he's crazy intelligent, you know, in terms of like, he, you know, I've, ne I've never seen anybody like watch more footage in my life. Every time oh, this wow. guy is like at a bre his breakfast table, dinner table, just sitting there, just watching footage, you know, just, just, just soaking everything up. Um, but he's got a team. So we have uh dog Julian, and me, we'd, we'd just discuss things. Okay, this is what he's doing for training. This is what, you know, okay, let's go around this path, like, in terms of sleep. And, you know, the funny thing is, is he would know what to do, but then he would also, he would turn to us and be like, okay, what is your, uh, what's your opinion, you know? And, <laughs> and you kind of like, oh. You know, yeah, like, all right, well, okay, you know. and, and like, um, that's Conor McGregor. <laughs> <laughs> like, I don't know if I'm going to tell you to go to bed, but yeah. uh, you should probably go to bed, but. No man, um, you know he's got a team. Like we had people like monitoring, like monitoring his sleep. Like, they had a they had a thing that's basically telling him like how his sleep was. Um, you know, like Doc Julian was in the Olympics for uh, like cycling and things like mm. that. The guys, I mean, I, I've never asked him a question that he didn't know the answer to. It's it's, it's one. He's like a robot. Um, but it's cool to have you know he he brings somebody in for their own specific thing. And the cool thing is that we actually work as a team. There's a lot of teams I've been to where it's like. Mm. You know, people are in disagreement. Oh my God, you got the Jits coach being like, "This is what he needs to be," and I'm like, uh, "Wait a minute, like, I don't tell him how to do Jits. Why are you telling him what to eat?" You know, so um, that's a big thing. You know, working together. <laughs> yeah, it's got to be a tough, a tough deal because, uh, you know, as we mentioned in the beginning of the podcast, for some reason, especially like men, I think guys always think they know how to fight. Yeah. You know what 100%, I mean? man. Yeah. 100%. Like a man. guy who's oh, yeah. a guy who's big and strong is like, "Oh yeah, I could go over to Uriah Faber's place and jack some people up." It's like not any of the professional guys, you certainly wouldn't have a chance. And even some of the amateur guys have only been over there for a year. Uh, probably take you down and put you in an ankle lock, and you'd probably be done. Right? No, <laughs> you it's, know? it's crazy. You'll probably cry. <laughs> Man, yeah. The the more time I spend doing martial arts, the less I ever want to get in a fight with somebody because you learn. That's it. You know, I mean, it's and you hear a lot of guys that that train consistently in MMA or whatever. Any martial arts say it's, that. Uh, you know, it's it's also not any different for somebody who's heard some stuff about nutrition here and there. You guys are living it every day. Right. Yeah. You're with people every day. You're monitoring things every day. You're you're looking at 
uh, sleep cycles and all kinds of different things. You guys looking at uh, blood work at all? Yeah, you know, occasionally we will. You know, I know, I know Dan's big into the blood work. You know, I'm I've got. Do you kind of out you outsource that a little bit sometimes, or is it like you know he he handle it, or how do you guys do that? It really depends on the client, I think. You know, but but uh, yeah, I mean, generally, if we're working with somebody over a longer period of time, where we can have some pretty dramatic uh, impact and a deficiency, like if we notice uh, some significant things that we can't seem to f solve, right? If we have a program going you know with somebody and they're still uh, a step off and not recovering like we think they should be or something then it's maybe a time we would recommend some blood work um, or with a client we're going to work with long term we may recommend it and then no okay, okay we can do some interventions here if they have a certain deficiency in whatever zinc pick whatever it is yeah. you know um, and then do some dietary intervention to help with that but as a general rule if we're working with somebody you know the majority of the athletes we work with uh, outside of you know through our website and things like that I mean it's fight week you know, right. so we're not going to go to a, an athlete and say, well, listen, we're going to help you make weight this week. We want you to get blood work first, you know? So it just, again, it's very dependent on the client, but right. yeah, we do. I mean, it, and if clients have blood work, like recent blood work done, we always ask for it and, and try to review it. But right. yeah. George seems to be uh, very intuitive uh, when it comes to a lot of this stuff. What, what do you think his best trait is in, in being able to uh, help some of these uh, nutrition problems for people? You asking me to give George a compliment? <laughs> Set him up for one. Yeah, no. Uh, George he seems is, to be pretty like uh, <laughs> basically like you, you stumped him the first yeah. first time he's been stumped today, and it's just a question. Like, he got nothing good to say. Tell me something good about George. Yeah. No. Um, listen, he's got I got a great yeah. voice. Uh, yeah. <laughs> you do have an awesome voice, George. <laughs> yeah, we were actually just right before we went live talking about uh, how George after we finish up our careers in nutrition is going to maybe do some children's book narration. I think Monster. every time, it, well, every time he calls, my son knows exactly who's on the phone <laughs> and runs in uncle George. Uh, no, George's best attributes. I mean, look, George has been my mentor in this business. I mean, ever since the, we, we first started and, uh, I think George genuine, his, his biggest attribute as a nutritionist is, is genuine concern for his clients. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, it, it's everything he's saying is absolutely genuine. He spends time uh, getting to know clients, getting to know what helps them, what makes them tick, what things nutritionally are going to benefit them based on what they like. I mean, it, it's, he gets to know their families. He knows everything about every client he works with. So um, I would say that is probably besides the encyclopedia of knowledge that he has and the photographic memory and the, I mean it's I can I can go on and on I don't like him but <laughs> I know he, he you know that that would be my biggest uh, the biggest attribute I would say about George is he, he's genuinely concerned so he's able to apply all of this knowledge he has in, in a in a very personalized manner because he really does care about each person it's not just a client on a piece of paper it's somebody that he's really trying to have a lasting impact on their life so yeah. every client he takes on he looks at, at that as an, a, an opportunity to mentor somebody with something he's very passionate about yeah people definitely need to know that you care because otherwise you know a lot of times uh if you just send somebody something you just send them hey here's the food list or here's what you're supposed to eat yeah they're not going to really follow it but when they kind of learn that you care about uh, their well-being you care about them being better yeah. uh, then it's a lot easier for them to be on board yeah well sure it's like the example we just said you know it's it's um you know, if you've been eating on a diet for two days and then you go off that diet one day and then your nutritionist sits down with you and says, okay, well, let's talk about why that happened. I'm genuinely concerned about how we can benefit. Like, how, how do we learn from this situation and, and grow and get you back on your path to be successful and hit your goals and feel good right. about it, right? And so every time we do that with the client, I mean, when George and I started with this, I mean, George started with a couple of clients and now we're up to 130 clients. And that has been uh, with no advertising or marketing or anything right. it's just people getting to know who george and i are and understanding that we really care about their success so um that's what we built our business around and that's really a testament to george man i mean that's who george is when it comes to the sleep stuff um uh, you know there's been more and more people talking about it uh more recently um what what kind of recommendations do you guys have you guys have any tips or tricks for people to uh, get more restful sleep and then also about how much sleep do some of these people need go ahead man um you know like i'll go outside to grand with this and obviously this is uh, you know like it's part of what we do but not like what we do yeah um but 
Honestly, I think that the, the more natural things are, like I would say consistency again, like with nutrition, consistency with sleep, and like, you know, you're training your body to go to bed at the same exact time. Mm. Um, and I think sometimes we need more sleep than others. Like if you're, you're, you're banging things out, you know what I mean? Like um, workout-wise, you know, you might need more sleep, obviously for, for re you know, recovery of your muscles and things like that. Um, and then less sleep, obviously. Like you ever woke up on a day where you had literally nothing, you were excited that day, you might slept for like five, six hours, and you're like man I, you know right. and then there's those days it's like man you got freaking paperwork and all this other crap i'm tired before the day even gets started you know <laughs> um i uh you know like when i was in the marine corps when i was training if i didn't get eight, you know eight hours of sleep it was it was all she wrote like i'm like yeah. and then it, you know it started getting to like six hours and it was like four hours it's like okay man well we slept last night so it's good you know what i mean right. it's like you don't you know you don't need as much as as you you know you think right as a fighter it's like how much do they need well a lot of that just like nutrition is based on their um their uh their activities like how right. hard they're training and things like that but the best thing and like i said the most most important thing i think is consistency and that's one of the hardest things like with connor is because not only we're, we're in different places um different environments but different freaking time zones yeah. you know so it's like now it's like he's got to be on point it's like damn this is what time he's supposed to freaking sleep right and i think that's something that fighters and people need to you know keep in um keep in their brain housing group like when when a flighter flies from australia over here that's i mean you've been training at let's say six o'clock in the you know evening and now back let's say in australia now it's like 12 o'clock and yeah. you know your body's got to get used to that so right yeah so just I mean, keep it simple though huh keep it yeah. simple yeah and do do some of the obvious things you know i mean uh prioritizing sleep and knowing like okay if i'm going to try to get to bed at 11 tonight by 10 o'clock i need to start setting myself up for success with sleep like almost like a warm-up to go to sleep mm -hmm. right and starting to eliminate uh l sitting under lights or looking at a tv screen or looking at a computer screen you know take time and sit down to read do so i I'm a big fan of, I take usually melatonin, like a two grams of melatonin before I go to sleep and kind of start easing myself into uh, getting ready to go to bed. But just making it a priority. Most people don't do that. They sit down at the end of the day and they watch TV or they, they sit on their phone or sit on the laptop or whatever. And uh, they inevitably just stay up and think more right. about more problems or the next thing they need to look up or the, the mean tweet they saw and then they can't sleep because they're pissed off about some shit somebody said online or whatever right. you know you just need to cut those things off and prioritize sleep uh just like you do your nutrition just like you do your training it just needs to be a piece of something that it, it takes some some uh forethought right some some focus when it comes to uh general population are you guys uh okay with uh the different proteins that people eat like like red meat and things like that i know with the fighters you don't seem like to be a huge fan of it because uh it occupies a little bit too much of a, of your digestion, uh, but for some other people that main, mainly are just lifting weights, like a lot of the powerlifters watching the show, um, do you think red meat would be okay? Because uh, you know we don't we don't need that energy. Uh, the same way maybe a fighter does yeah absolutely yeah, i think yeah. so yeah i mean and i even use red meat pretty consistently in camp with fighters i mean the nutrient density you get out of a piece right. of red meat versus a, a chicken breast i mean there's no comparison right um so yeah i absolutely include red meat and uh, i mean really we don't we we start eliminating red meat during the cut uh yeah. or like immediately you know five hours before a fight we're not gonna right, the right. last meal give somebody something like uh you know a big steak but yeah in terms of nutrient density and and um you know the the fat profile of like a good piece of grass-fed beef i mean i think it's you're getting so much bang for your buck in terms of micronutrition you know mm -hmm. and micronutrients um, that you're just not getting from other sources so i think yeah it's an excellent excellent source of protein and something you should be including um, even organ meats and things like that from beef like beef liver is fantastic so we try to include that as much as fighters will let us you know i mean right. some guys won't eat that but yeah absolutely what about uh like uh pre-workout i know you've talked about uh, honey um what about like i don't know let's just say somebody uh you know wakes up at eight o'clock and they're supposed to train at like 10 do they they eat some food in the morning or you know how, how what does it look like so, you know, let's say they're doing, like, strength training or, like, you know what I mean? Obviously, I want to, you know, have some food in their, in their bellies. But, like, we talk about the hormonal responses of food. 
we uh we typically give people protein before they work out for the hormone response of glucagon, basically telling the body to release free fatty acids and store glycogen. Um, <clears throat> we will put like some fruit. Like I think one of the my, my favorite things for people is like uh, kefir, like let's say like a cup, cup and a half of kefir with some fruit and uh, chia seeds because, you know, obviously like omega-3s we're really big into as well. Right. Giving a little something. It's nothing big, you know, that they're, you know, it's going to upset their stomach or anything like that. But again, it's going to create that hormonal response. Mm. Um, I'm also a big fan of beta alanine, you know, typically like 4,000 milligrams a day, you know, um, first thing in the morning, like you just get ready for the tingles, right. <laughs> yeah. uh, yeah. you know, but, um, other than that, you know, and then, um, and then right before, uh, the workout, like I said, like a little bit of honey and beta alanine is for about beta alanine. So we have something called carnosine in our bodies. Your body doesn't create, you know, enough of it. It's basically a buffer, you know, helps out with muscular endurance. Thing is, a lot of things that we ingest, you know, once it gets through our digestive system, it doesn't stay the same. It doesn't stay the same product. Now, if you mix hestidine with uh, uh, beta alanine, it becomes that carnosine. So, again, it helps, like, buffer the muscle. It helps increase muscular endurance. And there's tons and tons of study. Like, the NSCA has done tons of studies yeah. on that. Um, and another one that we use, but, you know, like, we don't always promote, you know, we give it to Connor and stuff like that is um, – is uh, baking soda, like sodium bicarbonate. You mm. know, I'm a big fan of that. Um, you know. Does that um, help with the stomach or something like that? What does that do? It helps uh, buffer. It does the opposite of helping yeah. your stomach. Oh, it'll, it'll definitely help your stomach. <laughs> you know, you know, but, uh, you know, so basically, it's a, it's a buffer. You know, like people that um, are um, have a high level of acidity in their oh, body. I see. Um, yeah, so if you, you know, if you ever take like a strip, like before you, I don't know if you've ever seen those uh, um, alkaline strips. Yep. Yep. You know, if you take one, before you work out, after you work out, I mean, after you work out, things like black. But you take in, like, sodium bicarbonate, man, you'll, uh, I mean, it'll, it'll help out with that. And you, you'll feel it right off the bat, you mm. know. Um, problem is, is that because of the sodium, like, a lot of people can get osmotic diarrhea. Basically, pulls all the oh, gotcha. water. And you'll be sitting on the pot, you know. <laughs> but... Um, for a while, but afterwards you feel great. It's like a super soaker. It is <laughs> like, the most dude, intense insane, thing of all time. Bro. He's but, very much underselling this right yeah, now. I am. I, we, we, we thought about, like, you know, we can package this as, like, Ass Blast 2000. You know what I'm saying? Like, just for people, yeah, who are constipated, just yeah, blast yeah. it out of the Shoot your pants off and then run a marathon. There it's, you go. Increase performance and lose weight yeah. at the same time. Like uh, magnesium citrate. Does yeah, the same yes, thing. yes. <laughs> Yeah, the first time he ever talked to me about this, we were still in the Marine Corps together, and he's like, "Yeah, man, we're gonna go spar, so we're gonna do, the, you know, some, we're gonna take some baking soda beforehand and let's see how we how we respond." And I'm like, "All right, man, I trust you, no problem." <laughs> it one of the more intense. An hour and a half later, I was like, "I am still not ready," you know what I mean? Because there will be shit all over the mat. So, dude, it took some time uh... to learn. So you have to, for that. Figure, you have to figure out how much you can take. Yes. I'm just try, trying to make it very clear to the listeners, do not take baking soda <laughs> and then go lift, like right after, because you will not be invited back to the gym. So, it, it, But it basically would help you with uh, endurance. Is that it? Right. Yes, it's a buffer, right? So uh, like waste products of, of muscle contraction, right? They become gotcha. limiting factors in exercise, you know? So um, same with carnosine. Um you're buffering those out so you're able to contract the muscle more efficiently for longer. I mean, with with uh, with a lifter like uh, no, not beta alanine, but um, you know, baking soda, I don't think would have the same effects. Like anything from like a three to five minute window mm. in that you know basically um, aerobic system, it, it'd be super helpful. But like somebody that's lifting, maybe not so much. Right. But what do you think about uh, the you know people talk about kind of the the trauma that fighters go through? Uh, you know, getting punched, getting kicked, and yeah. so on. Um, and, and then also them being, uh, dehydrated. Uh, do you think the way the rules and stuff are set up right now are, are, are okay? Or you think, uh, these weight cuts and stuff could be factoring into, uh, these guys potentially getting hurt, hurt worse or the way that you guys rehydrate, you think that that's, uh, maybe, maybe helping them enough, uh, in their fight. Right. I definitely believe like, you know, people working with us, they're obviously, you know, um, gonna be good to go the thing right. is that everybody talks about is is uh the blood brain barrier making sure that you know the the body doesn't have enough um fluid like it's been de it, it, it's dehydrated right. so it's not protecting the brain um you know we have those osmoreceptors and the one thing is it takes at least 72 hours to rehydrate the brain mm. what people don't realize is that it also takes a long time for you to dehydrate because the body that's the last uh -huh. place your body's gonna start pulling water so everybody's like oh you know the, you know we we talked to uh dr kenefic yeah. he's this guy's 
got a freaking a PhD in oil rehydration. He's like, right. dude, there's no way that these people are freaking uh, near dehydrated enough. For yeah, that. your brain cells have protective measures specifically against that right. as well, right? You have idiogenic osmols in your brain cells that basically like change the solute in your in your brain cell mm -hmm. so that you're not drawing fluid from your brain cell the same way you would like a muscle cell. So, I mean, if you are uh, efficiently rehydrating yourself and doing the cut in an efficient manner, not over an extremely long period of time where you're drawing a ton of fluid from your brain, um, like we do, right? Uh, over a short period of time where you're cutting over, you know, two and a half, three days, uh, it, it's not a, a concern in the way that I think a lot of people have made it, to us at least. Right. What's uh, kind of the biggest change you guys made maybe over the last year or so? Like, uh, you know how, like, you just kind of keep seeing new research or you guys are, you know, maybe a fighter loses a fight or whatever. You, you're always gaining knowledge and you're always uh, improving. So what's something you've seen maybe in the last year or so or last couple months maybe even? Man, I uh, oh, so many things. Like, um, you know, you're, you're constantly trying to figure out, okay, you know, the one thing is that, you know, I, I I don't, I'm probably going to offend a lot of people, but like I know a lot of bodybuilders and a lot of, you know, power lifters and stuff like that. They do stuff because it's like basically regurgitation of knowledge. They don't yeah. actually understand why, you know, like a bodybuilder, like a lot of times they're like, you know, um, when my, one of my exes, like they'd get ready for a show or a figure competition, they'd have like a couple glasses of wine. They, they like, I don't know. That's the way we've always done it. You know, like wrestlers would take honey. Why do you do it? I don't know. And that, what I want is like us to like, okay, this, this symptom happened what do we do to affect this and like you know try and keep this aldosterone down okay what happens when the blood pressure gets to here like um we've changed so much in terms of like timing of the baths like when you get out of the bath your body cools down like that right um and that's the time we really want them sweating the most we don't want them sweating the most in the bath we want it when they're out of the bath because uh basically it's, the body's cooling itself off and it's a, a lot less aggressive the water basically it's kind of like if you stuck your hand in 180 degree water you know you'd burn the hell out of your hand you yeah. put it 180 degree freaking sauna it's, it's not it's not that much so it's huge effect on the body but what we're doing is we're heating up that core temperature so you know back in the day like now we're starting to do like we got cold weather gear that we're using that uh they basically like roll out of the tub they don't stand up because you know they stand up those bar receptors they start kicking in you do that too fast then they go out mm -hmm. right so they're rolling out and they're they're just like falling into these like uh these uh, like uh cold weather gear we just zip them up, and they just lay there. Uh, Sear, he did two baths, uh, one at night, one in the morning. He sat in the cold weather gear. We're just sitting there talking. We call it, like, in the Marine Corps, we used to call it, like, a pickle because you look like a freaking pickle while you're in this thing. Um, he lost, like, six pounds his first one and then six wow. pounds the second one, and it was, it was all she wrote. Yeah, some of the stuff with the re oral rehydration we really learned a lot about, too, <laughs> just, like, uh, you know, looking at how we how much sodium we're having to reload into somebody over the course of an hour and a half, two hours, right, through a few shakes and, and finding that, uh, when you're giving somebody who has a really significant cut a ton of fluid or a ton of sodium, they, they can get osmotic diarrhea just like with the baking soda. So um, having to uh, adjust our, our oil rehydration ratios and how much we're giving people when and, and, uh, and fine-tuning that has been a really uh, huge eye-opening learning experience. Talking to guys like Dr. Kenefick about how to really – uh, nail that thing down perfectly that's been a big thing this year for us to like now really feel like we have it to a, a level that's perfect you know? right. yeah have you been able to heal anybody's gut like you run into somebody that just they don't they can't digest anything like uh just everything they eat they fucking shit it out yeah i mean i think i i found with uh trying to asking heal... for a friend <laughs> <laughs> Son of a bitch. Yeah, <laughs> I mean, you know, I think a lot of what people, uh, what I find with people that maybe do have some gut issue is is uh, what they're not eating anymore when they mm. start working with us. That's become a big thing. And then, you know, when we start adding in things uh, like fermentable uh, fiber that's creating butyrate and helping heal the, soul, uh, the, the, the lining of the gut and things, I mean, over time. Um, but, I mean, we're not getting you know, like stool samples set out and getting like, you yeah. know, microbiome tests for clients. I mean, if that's something that they were after, we could do. But we're still trying to give a lot of people a lot of prebiotic fiber, fermented foods. Um, and in a general sense, you'll see, I think it's not like one piece, right? If you mm. see somebody that has in their blood work, like really high C-reactive protein, or they have like a, a, a lot of big markers for inflammation, and then we have them do blood work later on. It's hard to say, like, well, they have less inflammation because I helped heal their gut. It could be because I helped them have a, uh, better sleep habits. They right. have a cleaner diet. Their training is more efficient. It, it's, it's a number of things. So, um, But, yeah, we absolutely try to uh, account for that. And if somebody has really, really serious gut issue, um, then we – 
as a general rule for a, a person not in training camp, like a, a, an average Joe, I would start doing a bit of like an elimination diet, pulling things out, right. um, getting down to a very basic diet, and then trying to slowly integrate things at, at, and see how they, they affect that person, if they have any right. any issue with it. And then, yeah, adding a probiotic, adding a lot of prebiotic fiber uh, seems to really help. Hmm. What, uh, what kind of uh, prebiotic fibers are there? Like what, where do you get that from? Oh, I mean, a fermentable fiber that's, uh, I mean, just... Like kimchi yeah. or... Oh, ferment, yeah, ferment, yeah. Fermented foods, yeah, like kimchi, sauerkraut, kefir's gotcha, a great okay. one. Um, fermented pickles, like lacto-fermented pickles are one of my favorites. Um, but, uh, yeah, I mean, any way you can integrate those in your diet are great. And then pre prebiotic fiber, like, um, you know, just green leafy vegetables and fermentable yeah. fibers like that that are... Uh, an ex I mean, basically, as your gut microbiome starts to break those down, they create a short-chain fatty acid called butyrate. And that's what mm. helps heal the endothelial lining of your cells and your gut. So a lot of people who have like leaky gut issue, um, once they start eliminating the things, you know, the processed foods that are causing that problem from right. their diet and then starting to give their microbiome the what fuel wants, they yeah. need to give you what you need. I mean, it's a pretty incredible relationship, right? You right. have all these little foot soldiers in your gut and if you give them the right shit, then they're going to generate what your body needs, you know? So uh, it's oftentimes we're just giving them the wrong things. We're giving sugar constantly to the bad bacteria and yeast and you start getting people with, you know, SIBO and issues like that. Right. So um, yeah, it's just dependent person to person, I think. But what does uh, kefir do for us? It's like one of those things, man. It's a, it's a great probiotic itself, man. Cleans out the system like anything else. And the cool thing is like a lot of people that take anything like, like lactose, um, it's because of a lack of enzyme, like lactase. Mm -hmm. You know, and the one thing I have is it has tons of lactase. And um, I don't know, like a lot of people that have taken it, it's high in protein, low in carb. Um, it helps out with sati. You can mix it with fruit. You can do, you know, there's so right. many things you can do with it. And like if you read about kefir, is maybe yogurt the same or no? No, no. Like you're not going to have near as much bacteria. Like I think, oh, okay. I think how much is... Uh, like 98% of our cells, like 90% of our cells are like bacteria, you know, like it's either you got good bacteria, bad bacteria, right. you know, making sure that we have that good bacteria. And that's, you know, that's one of the reasons I, I give people kefir so much. And like I said, because- Are like, people like, fuck this? Because kefir is like, di it's different. Bro, you know, like- <laughs> Yeah, it's sour. Be people I mean, I don't, I don't mind it. I, I yeah. like, like, I like a lot of natural tasting stuff. Right. Most, people either people love it or hate it, you yeah. know, like they're like, this is the shit or this is shit. So, yeah. you know. Yeah. Um, it, it's funny too. I've even seen people who hated it starting out and eventually begin to like it. And, uh, you know, the more research I do on, on the gut microbiome and, and gut health in general, the more I realize that it's such an emerging science. I don't think we actually really have a grasp on yeah. uh, how to how any of that really functions and what the relationships between certain types of bacteria are. But one thing I do find that's pretty interesting is a lot of times, like even with sauerkraut and kimchi and kefir, people really don't like those. And then down the road, like I'll, they'll, I'll see them, I'm eating it. I got, yeah, you yeah, know, yeah. and, and, and comment on it and they'll say well yeah i actually really enjoy it now and part of me wonders and i, I mean this is completely just my opinion if their gut microbiome is changing over time and they're starting to actually crave those things and we yeah. have the vagus nerve that runs from our brain right to our gut and that microbiome is talking directly to our gut so a lot of the time i find that people i think are generally um like their 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 palate is adapting and a lot of that, I think, has to do with how their gut microbiome is changing. So people who have been eating shit processed food and super hyper palatable stuff that's terrible for their gut crave those things until they eventually eliminate them. And as their good bacteria are starting to get a stronger foothold, they're starting to get the tools and the fuel they need, uh, your taste can actually change with that. You know, you're It's a weird thing to think that something else living inside you that's not you is kind of dictating what you're craving. But I think there's a, there's a lot of science out there saying that that, that is the case. I think it's pretty simple. If you uh, don't like the taste of many healthy foods, then you probably have a problem. Yeah. You know, because a lot of these things are rich in flavor. You just don't notice it because of the Dorito effect that the we Dorito talked effect. about earlier. If yeah. you're used to eating uh, pizza and hot dogs from 7-Eleven uh, or those, you ever see like the weird shit they have at 7-Eleven? Like they have the, those, uh, it, it's like a sausage, but then it it's got like, like, looks like a shit dog. Like, yeah. Really and then it's got like, like cheese and bacon yeah. and everything. I mean, yeah. they taste phenomenal, yeah. but, uh, <laughs> you know, try, a friend told me, I don't know. Yeah. yeah. Uh, try even just enjoying a glass of milk after eating something like that. Like you're just not going to taste it anymore. Right. Yeah. You can be desensitized to it, to a, uh, a certain degree. And I think, um, what you're saying sounds to me like uh, once people start to eliminate stuff from their diet, um, when they have some of these natural things in front of them, uh, let, let's just say 
let's just say you took somebody and you said, hey, you know, I want you to really limit your carbohydrates for the next 30 days. Really, the only carbohydrates you're going to have are going to come from some vegetables. Mm -hmm. And then you give them fruit. And they're going to be like, holy shit, that yeah. fruit tastes, a pineapple, yeah. an orange. Now that thing tastes so good yeah. because uh, they got rid of a lot of the junk food that they were, uh, you know, overindulging in. And, and the, uh, again, those flavors kind of desensitizing you to how things are supposed to naturally taste. Mm -hmm. uh, when you remove a lot of those things and even just eating spinach, just plain by itself, you're like, oh my God, spinach has like a nutty flavor to it. Yeah. <laughs> but you would never know that because you drown it in tons of ranch dressing all the time. <laughs> right. You know, or yeah. bacon and cheese and everything else. You know? Yeah, it's so. interesting how your body starts to crave things that are actually good for it, right, over, over time versus the things that you've just been giving it. You know, your body adapts to what it has available, you know, and so once it starts having things that are very nutrient-dense and beneficial and it's feeling, you know, vibrant and optimized, it starts to crave those things. I mean, it's it's been something that I've heard echoed by clients for years and years, right. and I'm, I'm sure both of you guys have experienced that too, but I mean, I experienced it in my own life too. I mean, it's, I never thought there would come a day in my life where I crave salad, but I do. It's a weird thing. But well, I was... especially if it's a good salad. Right. We had an awesome salad with Kyle Kingsbury. Oh, dude, that was so good. It's like one of the better meals of my life. Yeah. yeah. I, I asked his wife, I like four or five times, like, dude, what did you put in this? And she's like, oh, just a ton of salt. I'm like, no, there's more to well, it than uh, that. And I'm just like. Uh, they might have gave us some psychedelics. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, Kyle's we an did, interesting dude. Yeah, yeah, we did overly enjoy that salad. So <laughs> we, we who the it. fuck knows? We might have been awesome. fucked up. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you put some yeah. mushrooms in I, it. I thought then... it was weird when we were all naked all of a sudden. <laughs> but, yeah. you know. No, that's how most of my salads end, too. It's, <laughs> no wonder why you like them. Normal thing. Yeah. <laughs> Crave my naked salad. <laughs> yeah, you guys earlier were talking talking about um somebody who was training and then like two hours later or so, who woke up and then two hours later they're gonna train what if like your everyday person who's like fighting the clock you know they're waking up at 6 a.m <laughs> trying to get in a training session and then they got to be at work at like eight o'clock what's should they be training fasted or should they be eat so, eat something or should they be focused on like the post-workout meal well i think it's dependent on their goals first of all i mean if they're trying to lose weight then yeah absolutely go and hit the gym fasted also but go to bed early and wake up a little early you hit it right on the <laughs> yeah head. that's exactly yeah. what i was going to say go to bed earlier get up earlier and eat your meal you know i mm -hmm. mean it's just how bad do you want to accomplish your goals because you need to to build your your whole life around uh what's going to be beneficial to you and your schedule so yeah yeah you, you also might want to try you also might want to try it both ways you know yeah. try 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 you know go into the gym fasted and then try you know just Maybe during, during uh, certain periods, you try certain things and you, you switch in and out of them. Yeah, absolutely. And you can train change your training around those changes as well, right? I mean, right. you can do more aerobic work and train in a fasted state and get the benefit to, to your body and your mitochondria from that style of training versus eating beforehand and being very optimized and working on new PRs or a lot yeah, of volume I've, training. I've, I'll have some days where I'm like, oh, I, you know, I got an opportunity to eat over here. Um, but if I'm going to like, uh, you know, eat some meat or eat something like if that's where my mind is at and that's what I was going to eat, then I'm like, ah, it's really just easier just to train because if I train, uh, I don't have to take, uh, you know, 15 minutes to eat the food or maybe even 15 minutes to cook it, 15 minutes to eat it, uh, 30 minutes to process some of it yeah. and it's still not digested while I'm trying to train. And mm -hmm. so sometimes it's just easier for me to be like, well, I'll just go train. But it really is de highly dependent on the goal. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Like everything. And again, with your, with the guys that you guys are training and working with all the time, they they don't they can't they can't afford to really miss meals. It sounds like. No, and we do a lot of fasting. It is like, like at the end of the day, like people are like, well, you know, they're not losing weight. Why do they do a fast? Because I actually need to see what their weight. Like, we ask them for their weight right before they go to bed, weight when they wake up. Oh yeah, you talk about up. true weight versus uh, right. You know, some they they have different body weight all the time. They weigh themselves throughout the day. Yeah, so they'll do like they don't. You know, I don't want to drive them crazy with it, but they'll do it before they uh, work out, right after they're done working out. Like you have some guys that float like crazy. Like we have a girl right now that she fights at 115 she floats eight pounds a night wow floats, you know, she's 115 i'm like dude she's a freaking an wow that's that's a lot for somebody that low a body weight yeah. yeah you know we we have you know we have a guy that he does 10 pounds every time he's a 155 or but like the girl she's like why am i you know why do i float so much and i'm like uh i'm not even gonna begin to like pretend like i know the answer <laughs> that like eight pounds is ridiculous man like you know you're you're 10 pounds and float eight of it i don't, I don't know <laughs> but um 
Yeah, man, like understanding, but understanding how they, how they, you know, some people, um, you know, so, you, you know, you get into this number game and you start realizing like, okay, there's certain, like we talk about the human factors. Some guys, some guys don't actually um, float for anything. Mm. And, and again, you know, I'm like, crap, you know, are they already dehydrated? Is there something that I'm missing? And then they go and they get on the treadmill for like five minutes and they're drenched, you know? So they actually need, okay, this person needs to work out. This person doesn't need to work out, you know? So understanding how they're floating kind of, kind of gives us basically the game plan what we're going to need obviously if they're going to work out more we need to be loading them up a little bit more with carbs you know to give them the energy needed to do it and if they're just chilling man we're going to give them like a lot of fats and things like that how'd you guys meet me and him at a bar it was uh he thought know, i was cute and, uh, i bet it's, he had a pretty mouth he had the he had the beard already <laughs> he was <laughs> no did he have the beard going on no we actually met him. no we met yeah we met in the marine so i kind of looks like a lumberjack a little bit with that beard thank you yeah don't you think Bit what I'm going for. I, Did he have a flannel shirt on? He was holding an axe and had some work boots on and no pants. Mm -hmm. That's what I'm. I mean, that's what I'm picturing. Uh, that's a perfect yeah. picture. Actually, that's <laughs> rode off on his Harley. Yeah, that's how I want everyone to picture me. That's I, horrible. Yeah, George and I met in the Marine Corps, man, and um, actually we. I, George was teaching. I think I stole your water earlier. I think this is th this one was supposed to be mine, but I stole yours. So there's some water. <laughs> Thanks. <man>. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, we met in the Marine Corps uh, in 2007. Yeah, it was like 2007. Yeah, and uh, George was teaching at the Martial Arts Center in Quantico, and I went there uh, as a student, and that's how I met George, and him and I hit it off right away. George was teaching nutrition there at the Martial Arts Center, and it was a huge interest of mine, uh, and so him and I hit it off right away, and then I eventually I got back from Afghanistan in 2010 and got orders to the Martial Arts Center to teach there. Uh, and so George is still an instructor there, and I, I you got orders to teach there. What does that mean? Uh, so, basically, my uh, my contract, my time in the Marines, was up oh. a, a few months after I was getting back from Afghanistan, mm. and so uh, I received orders. I requested to become an instructor there like years before that. Oh, okay. And uh, so I eventually got orders. They basically said like you can get out of the Corps if you want, or you can go teach at this martial arts center in Quantico, and that was like a huge dream of mine. So. Um, oh, so that's kind of cool. So you're able to still be in. Yeah, it was a non-deploying yeah. unit to go teach hand-to-hand -hand combat and and strength conditioning yeah, and nutrition. How fucking cool is it that? It was the greatest <laughs> that time. Awesome. Yeah, I mean, it was it was an incredible experience, and uh, I learned a ton in that process. But George was in, in, in teaching there, and uh, and that's I mean, that's how we met. We we immediately hit it off. I mean, I think the day I showed up, I went and said hello to everybody. I reported to my lieutenant colonel, said I'm here. And then George was like, go change your shit. We're going to go fight. Dude, like, yeah. and he, he's making it a lot more professional, too. So in the Marine Corps, <laughs> the more you like somebody, the more you mess with them. And uh, we had this stuff, like OC spray that you you guys uh, basically. Oh, when I was a student. Oh, yeah. Man. So we all liked Leith because Leith was he's just like a tough, you know, like you'd fight anybody at any time. And we used to do like a lot of like weapon sparring and stuff like that. But we had this one drill. Uh, I'll never forget it. Like they're at the top of this hill and they have the, you have these helmets, obviously, because you guys are hitting each other with like non-lethal gear and stuff like that. Um well, we were looking, they have all their helmets in the back of the truck and they have all their names in the back. We're like, where the hell's Lease? And we find Lease, and dude, I just doused it with OC spray. Just OC spray is mace. Yeah, literally, dude. So this dude, he puts it on, and the thing <laughs> is, is like it dries up. But once you like start sweating, and uh, actually, it's it in just... oil, so it like crystallizes in your in your <laughs> shit or whatever you spray it on. And as soon as you sweat, but when this shit hits your eyes, your eyes are closed. Like there is no Bro. fucking opening your eyes. There's a... no breathing anymore. It's in your lungs. Like you're you're snot and shit running. And uh, yeah, I put my fucking helmet. killed him. <laughs> well, and the worst thing is, is that was on the battle course. Yeah, yeah. Dude. So the battle course you do to to graduate the the martial arts center, the course is seven weeks, and the the like main last event you do is called the battle course, and uh, it's all day long. You're hiking for miles. You're fighting at all these different engagements. It's an all day event. I mean, it fucking kills you. It's really really intense. And in the middle of that. They did that to me. So I am running up this hill with my helmet on thinking I'm going to go fight somebody. And all of a sudden I was like, I can't. My face is on fire. Like I, can't, I can't see shit. And so I fight with the guys that you know at the, at the hill. And then I turn around and I see this asshole just dying at the top of the hill. Meanwhile, I still had like six hours left on this course I had to run. So I had the rest of the day just my face on fucking fire. The, that was... 
my introduction to that guy. <laughs> yeah. So we've been best friends ever since. <laughs> How did he do fighting wise? Did he do okay? Oh, lead, yeah. He's looking. He's like a little juggernaut. Just like the funny thing was, he looked like a you know like you see those people that are attacked by bees. So you know he couldn't. See, you can't see. You can't open your eyes or anything like that. But it's I like amazing. everything Bro, around him. Every, trees, everything grass. around him. If anybody came in the vicinity of him, they were gonna get taken out. Like just he was he was uh, very aggressive. Couldn't see where the fuck he was going, but he was aggressive as hell. So yeah, yeah, I remember that. It was good, and then it started dripping down. Like the sweat was dripping down, like into my shirt, and into, you know, oh. it was uh, I was on fire. But yeah, that's how we met, man. And we we kept working together. We we built uh, what I was really proud of, like a really great nutritional curriculum for that school together. And then yeah. George got out and started uh, working with athletes. And as soon as I got out, I mean, once we, we were stayed ready, in we started... contact ever since. Yeah. Oh yeah, we talked yeah. every day. How did uh, how did you get into nutrition? Man, I was uh, I was you know I was raised uh, when I was little I was morbidly obese I was 200 pounds when I was in sixth grade I was just a you know little hefty thing and um, you know as I got older I started like you know what man I, I'm tired of this like I made a decision I don't want to be this guy anymore so I basically started starving myself you know like you were just like I learned a lot of things what not to do by do this journey um, and you know I actually started lifting got into football and then I started fighting um, you know I you know I turned pro when I was 18, you know, went through every bad weight cut you could possibly think of. But I'd study, you know, on my own. Um, and then, <clears throat> you know, I went into the, the recon route, learned a lot through nutrition through there. Like when I got deployed, I'd help a lot of people out with nutrition. And then when I was at the Mace, um, they were doing the combat conditioning, you know, program. <clears throat> and then, you know, Colonel Shishko heard me talking and then I started doing like the, the uh, nutrition classes and things like that. And they started sending us around. They sent me and Leith like, um, you know, they had the Olympic Training Center come, the TSAC training come out to us. Uh, they sent us to API. We went to Florida to go learn that API, which was great. You know, we just got a, just a plethora of different environments, people, you know, different professions. Um, and then, you know, the funny thing is it all just happened by chance. Like mm. Brian's like, uh, Dude, man, I'm like, you know, he went from the W, he was the 205 world champ for WC, and then WC got bought out by UFC. And, um, you know, at UFC, he wasn't doing too well uh, at, at 205, mm -hmm. you know. And I told him, I was like, dude, because you got the biggest head and the littlest arms. He's like that fucking T Rex off of the, uh, Rob <laughs> the Robinsons, you know. Um, and I'm like, you have no reach, you know. So <clears throat> he's like, you think I can make 185? And, and then, sure, shit, you know, he made 185, and then we've just been doing it ever since. And then, you know, everybody just started calling. And, here we are, man. It's uh, crazy. <laughs> you said earlier you got deployed. You guys get deployed together uh, to no. some spots? No. No, oh. no. Maybe. Just we were separate units. George was a recon guy, and I was uh, an infantry guy. So deployed. We had different jobs until we went to the uh, hand to hand combat center. And you got deployed to Iraq. Yeah, he. You did. Did you do one in each or just? No, I did Afghanistan, not Iraq. Twice. Yeah. So I went to Iraq. You went to Afghanistan. I can't imagine what some of that's like. I mean, even with all the training and stuff, I mean, it's got to be, got to be extremely nerve wracking, right? <laughs> yeah, that's. I mean, you do have other people going. You got other people buy in stuff too, but it's got to be, got to be intense. Yeah, yeah, it's very intense shit, man. I mean, it's, uh, it's the best and worst experience that I've ever had. Yeah, that's I get, the best way to try to explain it. Be, getting through it, being able to survive, it makes you a different person when you get through the other side, right? Yeah, sure, you know, and also. Uh, the camaraderie and the, the the brotherhood and the trust and the I mean there's just things that you learn about people man that uh, you don't learn in any other environment other than combat I think yeah you know, you just I went to the uh, Marine uh, barracks when I went to Washington DC oh yeah and uh, I got to train with some of those guys and stuff and I just I put something up on Instagram and just said hey I'm in the area I want to train and a bunch of people were hitting me up oh there's this power thing gym and I was like I don't know you know there's this fitness center, and then if somebody hit me up from the Marines barracks, I'm like, I'm going there. That sounds like a lot of fun. <laughs> yeah. Those guys were so awesome, and they were so fired up to have me in there. And they're telling me, like, they're like, you're such a badass. And I'm like, this is ridiculous. I am I'm, I'm not a badass. You guys are amazing, you know, and I appreciate, you know, their services. I appreciate you guys uh, doing that for our country as well. Thanks. But what was really cool is after I did that, you know, I posted, like, a picture or two from there. Uh, I must have got a, over 100 messages from Marines that weren't even there. Right. They are like, hey, man, thanks a lot, man. That yeah. means a lot to us. Yeah, it's a small community, man. The Marine Corps is a very small thing, and it's a, it's a tight-knit family. And, and uh, yeah, anytime a Marine sees somebody taking care of Marines, man, it's a, you know, everybody really appreciates. We all 
uh, gather around that person, you know, because it's it's a small community and we get shit on quite a bit in the Marines. So anytime somebody steps up and 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 you know wants to hang out, wants to right. train, wants to impart all the knowledge they have, I mean, it's it's uh, we we got to experience that at the Martial Arts Center quite a bit with guys coming out to train with us, and it was always oh, it's a huge deal, right? Like, yeah. or even somebody sends you something, yeah. You know, we, we fire out slingshots and all kinds of products out to uh, all branches of the military. Yeah. But, you know, the, the what we get back when people when people write to us, they're so excited because, let's face it, like you're in some shit, right? Yeah, yeah. man. Yeah. You know, things things aren't great. And so uh, just being able to, uh, you know, me having the opportunity to go there and check that out was super cool. And they were so excited to show me around. They were showing me all kinds of shit. Oh, yeah. And I'm like, ah, oh, we're not really supposed to be in this area, but don't worry about it. Don't say anything. Just don't take any pictures. You know? <laughs> they were showing me all kinds of shit. Yeah, so it was, it was super cool. Yeah, yeah, if you ever get the chance, if you go back over that way, you got to check out Quantico. Go down a little I will. bit further south. I will. Man. I heard that that's fucking amazing. Quantico's an incredible place to see and see all the training facilities they have out there and all the, you know, that's where the, the all the Marine infantry officers are training. And I mean, it's, it's a really incredible, uh, thing to see, man. And Where do you live at? I live in LA now. I'm from Michigan, but oh, okay. yeah, I live in LA now. And then you're in what? Jo- uh, Atlanta. Yeah, I'm in Georgia. Yep. Oh, okay. George from Georgia. Mm-hmm. Cool. And then how do you guys? Uh, how do you guys? Do you guys collaborate a lot with working with uh, clients, or is it like he? You know, he's got ten people, and you get, or how's it work? No, we we're constantly on the phone and everything. You know, <clears throat> you know, getting cards like right now. You know, working on the chili card. We got chili coming up, Chicago, L.A., uh, Utica. We got. I mean, so <clears throat> you know, I'll be calling because, like I said, we're getting people certified at each card. So like, I'll get people like, all right, I'm gonna call these people. We got and we got to vet them because the thing is, is like they actually get hands on with the fighters, but we can't have like fanboys. You know what I mean? Like, mm. oh, I want to. You know, like <clears throat> you know, we had uh, I think we had sixty. <laughs> three people hit us up for this last card in in jersey and we had one woman that got certified like that was it you know just kind of like yeah i don't know um you know and then he's uh (laughs) he's better at a lot more things like logistically like obviously he's a lot more uh i'd say uh polished Handsome. than i am you know what i'm saying he's, like, he's organized yeah, maybe, I, maybe you're not as organized oh no man you hear the way i talk like i'm talking <laughs> i probably answered maybe two of your questions today because you're like where the fuck's he going <laughs> like i go off on these tangents with my head's over here and you know like that's you know my partners and like we're we're a military you know owned company you know right. like obviously marine we just hired it's the coolest thing one of the guys from my old unit he, you know i didn't i wasn't actually in the marine corps with him but one of my old boys is like man he's looking for a job he's good at this you know blah 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 and then yeah man so we're, we're able to hire like you said be able cool. to help out marines that's like the coolest freaking thing in the world man it's 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 awesome but um yeah he does like i said like he uh you know call you know calls the fighters talks to the fighters you know like you know we have guys that do that but we you know we shift off of things but like i said he's a lot he's a lot better a little bit more polished out of like scheduling organizing right. and things like that how many uh like employees do you have how many people you got working for you now? <clears throat> man honestly well, we got like seven per yeah. seven or eight yeah with know. the new chef yeah we have eight now yeah. So it's, yeah, it's a small team, you know, but George and I work together, you know, I mean, we're on the phone too much, you know, I get tired of listening to him do this <laughs> shit all day, but he, yeah, he, uh, we don't get to work together with clients as often as we'd like, but when we do, man, it's a lot of fun, you know, we really make a good, and we're in a place now where the cards get so busy and I'm, I'm finally coming off this uh, year contract. I was working with Demi Lovato for a year. And so coming off working with like a, a pop star, getting back into yeah. MMA, it's, been, it's exciting because I'm going to get to work with him hands on at fights again and working with the cards and helping, you know, training the new, new people we have coming in, getting certified, teaching classes again, like all that stuff will be great to get together. And do now, how did this idea of like moving in with people, like how did that start? Like you, you're not, you're moving in and you're getting rid of crap food and you're shopping for them and you're pre- prepping every meal. Like how did that start? <clears throat> You know, honestly, so this is crazy. Like, so he got out of the Marine Corps and um, he started, you know, working on a construction company, right? Um, <clears throat> it's totally new to him. And that's why, you know, that's why I love him. Like, you know, like whatever you put in front of him, he's going to conquer it. You know, and like in a year's time, like he was like going up the, the road. But I was working with Chris Cyborg and Daniel Cormier calls. And he's like, hey, man, I need something to help me out with my cut. And I'm like, Dude, there's no way I can leave Chris. So I called him up and like literally like. He's like, got it. Yep. Dude, quit his job. Literally quit his job. Well, I mean, it sounds more... Yeah, when I got out of the Marines, like the comp, the, you know, we weren't in a place as a business where we, you know, like I, I had a little boy at home, I had a wife, like I, I, I had to get a real job, you know, I wanted to go chase this dream with him, but I'm like, I have mouths to feed, so I started working construction, and he called and said, hey, Daniel Cormier wants you to come live with him, like now's the time, let's do it. So I quit my job and did it. But to answer your question, which 
he again didn't. Uh, <laughs> did, I, did I serve the band? He didn't even come close. Squirrel. We got started doing this because fighters requested it. You know, we were working with fighters, but they, they like you said, they wanted to say, oh, okay, you did this with us, you know, uh, fight week, and you were here at the hotels, but like, how do I get you to come do this for six weeks? You know, mm. I have so much weight to lose. And so, you know, for some fighters, that's cost prohibitive, or it was. You know, I think we have it in a place now where it's, it's very reasonable for anybody to do, but um, yeah, back then it was just kind of a by request thing. People mm. would say like, I just want you to come here and take over this problem. You, you know, I, I have this issue with my weight. I need to get it down. I want to be, you know, this is the biggest championship fight of my life. So I want to cover every single avenue I can. And so then people started bringing this out. And now f other fighters, teammates see that at every camp. I and mean, we, we work with fighters at every major camp in the world. So fighters see us with their you know one of their teammates every day for six weeks and go shit well i'm fighting for a title and you know that happened to to me at american kickboxing academy i went there to work with daniel cormier and i mean a week later i was working with living with luke rockhold and yeah. then a week later i was working with kane velasquez i mean it was like I'm, i almost bought up an apartment there because i was i'm just bouncing from <laughs> fighter's house to fighter's house in the same team yeah. But it just became like a, a need for everybody. You know, I don't want to fucking deal with my diet anymore. Like, look at how that guy performed and he didn't have to do anything when he gets home. He doesn't have to drive himself to practice. So <laughs> people were like, you know, they jumped on it right away. Yeah. With uh, Daniel Cormay, he's preparing for a heavyweight championship fight. Yeah, he is. Are you uh, part of that process? Oh, yeah. Or yeah. is he just eating ho-hos? No, no, no. no. <laughs> Listen, all kidding aside, he's a big guy, right? And, you know, everybody jokes about his weight. But that guy is so fucking dedicated, man. And he, he uh, even going up to heavyweight, wants his diet to be perfect. Mm. You know, I mean, he, he that guy does not miss anything. He trains at a level that is it's hard to put in words. I mean, it's, it's incredible. And, and even going up to heavyweight, he won't. Outside of his diet, like when he's outside of camp, he'll go off the rails with what he eats. But mm. in camp, yeah, he's heavyweight, whatever, it doesn't matter. And we work with several heavyweights. I mean, even if they don't have to cut weight, I mean, I've, I worked with Kane they Velasquez. They just want better nutrition. Year. Yeah, they just want to perform at their best. And they want somebody to take the guesswork out of that, you know. And so mo most of these guys, they don't have any idea what they're doing when it comes to, to diet. So they just, they're happy to sit back and learn what they need to learn about their opponent and, and sharpen for the fight and, and just eat what we make for dinner do you find it harder to work with somebody that's kind of like him that's going to go off the rails outside of camp versus somebody who's going to be yeah. more consistently <laughs> yeah, yeah yeah i mean absolutely their weight cuts way more difficult mm -hmm. uh you know and and the amount of intervention and caloric restriction that we have to do in camp to get them to a reasonable weight before fight week uh, becomes a challenge because now you're walking a line between trying to get somebody to lose some body fat over the course of a month or two uh but also perform at an, you know the top level that they possibly can get a little bit better every single training session so you right. got to really find a balance between you know eliminating some calories and getting them down to weight but also yeah. making sure they perform well yeah where does he walk around at right now <laughs> I, I if you can share that i couldn't even guess honestly yeah. i don't honestly i don't even want to know <laughs> i don't even want to know i mean he, i could ask him but he would lie to me when i saw like uh he was taking on a lot of uh he was just doing a lot of work for ufc doing yeah. a lot of commentary and yeah. stuff uh i was like oh man i wonder if it's going to impact him but yeah, that guy's a savage man you know you see, any videos i see um you know he's working with person after person you know just uh wearing one guy out after another oh. and, and uh, kane Velasquez was always kind of the premium guy when it came yeah. to uh stamina and stuff and daniel cormay i mean is right there with him and and maybe even then some I mean, watching those guys train together is is inspiring be, shit man it, crazy yeah dc man i mean he just took over the the job as the head high school wrestling coach at his his, in his town he? i don't know he's doing <laughs> he's sense. doing <laughs> cage side commentary he's on ufc tonight he's the light heavyweight champion he's fighting for the heavyweight championship and now he's a high school wrestling coach you know and he has a kids high uh kids wrestling program at american kickboxing he's Academy. funny too he does a good job talking trash oh, yeah yeah he's great man <laughs> but yeah the guy is he's he's all over the place but most people i would say man that's too much but not that guy that guy just i don't he works at a level that it's 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 inspiring shit man he's a great yeah, he's dude. able to he's able to handle it yeah 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 and then he goes out there against like impossible odds and looks like a you know tiny guy in comparison to these goliath dudes he fights and then he cartwheels them through the air like they're fucking weightless that's and, unbelievable yeah what's going on with kane velasquez is he uh, uh, gonna make a comeback anytime soon yeah or? as far as i know last time i talked to him he he was he's always fun up. to watch yeah that guy's incredible man one, again one of the cooler people i've ever met in my life man just a total goofball and and awesome to be around but yeah he i mean he was really banged up you know his back was giving him a lot of issue and now uh 
after this last surgery he had, he's back training at, at 100%, and he's helping DC get ready. Last time I talked to him, he said he's ready to go. Mm. So, I mean, cool. he's... What's the uh, what's the goal? What's the overall goal? What are we what are we shooting for? What are we looking for in uh, the next couple months and next year or something like that? <clears throat> but I, what are you guys I, looking to do total domination, take over the world. Well, we, we've uh, we've had the same goal. Like we first started out, it's hilarious. I, I was like, I want the entire UFC. Um, you know, I'm 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 thinking by you know uh, end of next year, it's it's yeah. going to happen. And then the cool thing so is, you have about like a little more than half the roster, maybe <clears throat> right now. Yeah, the thing is, it's a it's a tipping point. We've had one big issue, and the the problem is, is all the big names that are able to afford us, we got them. Like right. the problem is, is the people we want to help out are the people on the, like the the lower end, and right. we just got <clears throat> some new stuff like like the certifications. Uh, we'll be able to fund those fighters, so not a, you know we'll be able to actually kind of sponsor these fighters oh. and help them out um, and get the rest of the people on the card. It's not that they don't want to work with us; it's just like man, I don't know if I can actually the money financial commitment. Exactly, yep. you know, in uh, the NFL, uh, the uh, agencies that represent uh, the guys that are about to be drafted right now. Um, they pay thousands and thousands and thousands of dollars to, uh, you know, these uh, high-end facilities to, to train these guys for the combine and stuff because there's, you know, millions and millions of dollars at stake right. uh, depending on where this guy gets selected. And UFC is not like that at all. It doesn't have that kind of uh, dollar amount associated with it. H has that gotten a lot better over the years from what you guys have seen? Yeah, the I think purse so. purse is getting pretty – I mean, are they getting a lot better and – yeah, I mean, it's definitely like if you look at you know like people like Connor and things, like it has definitely grown, um, but in terms of like us making money like off the fighters stuff like that, that's just definitely not the business model you want to be going after. It's uh, it's a popular sport and it's like, like like you know Lisa said like we genuinely you know we care about people yeah you know so the way we do it is like it's like do you you know charge this guy a bunch of money or do you, you charge all the people that like follow him so i think there's like twenty five thousand mma gyms in the united states so if we get the, the nutrition down where these people can follow like we get we have the fitness vt and stuff like that where people are following it um right. you know it's like we're able to help these people teach them make sure that their weight cuts healthy you know they perform you know the best of their right. ability and then when they get to the ufc then they can they can hire me or leith or, or the team yeah there's uh how many ufc fighters that are just what well, you would just say like are just professional and ain't got to worry about anything else probably not that many when you when it comes down to it no not every contracted guy right. you know has 500k in the bank right no gosh man i mean most of these guys you know are still teaching at the gym that they train in to make extra money i mean you got guys that you would see fighting on a pay-per-view they still can't you know pay for their i, I work with a female fighter that they couldn't even afford a cell phone yeah so i would just ha I, I could never text her or call her <laughs> or ask how she was doing i just had to go to her room and, and check on her constantly because right. she couldn't afford a phone fighting on pay-per-view though you know what i mean so you would think right. that she would but no i mean it's it's um it is growing and, and, and fighters are starting to make more money but uh yeah it's it's still a very new sport really yeah. and you know it's still growing and, and hopefully uh you know what george and i have have dedicated our lives to is going to continue to grow in the sport as it grows you know and hopefully like george said the model and the idea is to to be able to find ways to fund helping fighters that can't afford to pay for us in other mm -hmm. avenues so that's really what we've been focused on this year with uh, the dvd coming out and, and doing the certification program it is not only educating people that want to get certified i mean there's no school to go to for weight cutting i mean well, yeah. a lot of the things that we have have figured out how to do and, and george has really mastered is uh you know the opposite of what you would go to school for in nutrition tricking right. your body to dehydrate itself i mean it's not something that a, a dietitian's going to be like yeah i know how to do that they, right, every right. time we explain that to a, a, a doctor or a dietitian they're like how in the fuck did you figure this out <laughs> yeah. like it's the opposite so the idea would be to, to to show people what we've learned teach them through the certification program and when they pay to get trained it helps the fighters it helps the mm. sport so it's kind of a symbiotic thing we're trying to create where we're helping teach what we've learned and and in turn you know impart that on the fighters and i mean i was a wrestler growing up so a big goal for me is then to transcend into other weight class related sports and teach young wrestlers i, mean, I almost killed myself in high school cutting weight literally i mean i went into yeah. renal failure and almost died Shit. and um so you know eventually being able to help kids help young athletes i mean jujitsu and mma is getting more and more popular so eventually you know we want to help everybody in these sports with with what we do and i think we're getting there we're, yeah. we're on the way i'm gonna move you guys in with Smokey. he's too fat <laughs> 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 How'd you guys uh, get to meet uh, Ape Man? 
I know they're trying to get like a little bit more into MMA side of things. They're both uh, practicing jujitsu and doing some sparring and things like that. Right. Yeah. Do we? Uh, I met. Well, I met Adam because we were working with uh, CB. And I mean, oh, yeah, CB Holloway, right? Yeah, I mean, him. Uh, we we got to talking, you know, especially like a lot of nutrition stuff. And I was, t- you know, I was telling you earlier, this guy's a he's a freak. You look at him; he's two hundred twenty five pounds. The guy used to run ultra marathons, yeah. which is like that's I mean that's an anomaly. And I was like, dude, like you know, he's like, yeah, you know, I had this issue, and I ran a fifty miler once, and I was like, sounds awful. Dude, that's horrible. <laughs> like, why would you do that? Yeah. You know, like why would anybody have troubles driving that far? Um, but, uh, you know, now you look at him, he looks like, you know, like a power lifter. Like he's got, yeah. a, like he's like, he's put a lot of bulk and then he, it's funny cause he's going to go back and do it. So we, we don't, we connected real well. Like, you know, we, we talked a lot about the nutrition. Um, and then like we see everybody in MMA kind of like, oh, well, like, you know, what does you guys do? You know, got this, this apparel brand, you know, they're, they're new in the sport. We're new in the sport. Right. We're like, let's team up, you know? So we teamed up and it's been such a great, like, I mean, Everything's been working out so well. He's gonna be coming out to the fires. We'll be videotaping like so many things that cool. we're doing right now is because of them. So, you know, it was, it was a good it was a good partnership. You know, that's great. Yeah, that's awesome. Yeah, I, I've uh, I've always liked those guys. Those guys have been friends of mine for a while. Yeah, uh, had them on the podcast a while back, um, and uh, you know Noah um, is somebody that I you know still text and still contact here and there, and they've they've been good friends for a while. But it, it, what's really cool to me is that. And I didn't even really know this, but when we got him on the podcast, they, I asked him about their business and asked him about, you know, how it got started. They're like, well, we got in a power thing because of you. <laughs> and I was like, oh, shit. Okay, That's cool. Crazy. That's awesome. Yeah. That's awesome. Yeah, so that ended up being really cool. And then they were, on top of that, they were the first sponsor that we ever had for the podcast. And so oh, uh, that was a few years ago when no one else uh, believed or cared about what we were doing. And they, they swooped in. So it was really cool. That's awesome. That's very cool. Right. Where can people find you guys? What's your uh, Instagram? My Instagram is just d.leith. That's pretty fancy. Cool. D. And then, uh, what, uh, what website do you guys have? Lockhartandleith.com. Check us out. Our DVD is for sale on that. You can hit us up for the certification program on there. So if you're interested in learning more, the DVD is a good first step. Helps build a foundation. Teaches you a lot of the math that George rambled off like a machine gun. And <laughs> yeah, you know. But yeah, yeah, that math was crazy. No, dude, I have not, no idea. I just say numbers. You should watch him <laughs> do the, the the rehydration math. It's like watching fucking Rain Man. <laughs> <laughs> We've done it a couple times. What's the most weight you ever put back on somebody? Um, and, and and how to be effective, I guess. You know, honestly, important. it might be you, Leith. I mean, like, yeah. what was what we did a forty was so you know it's almost fifty. I yeah, so he lost. So I think it was like a three week or two week period. He had to drop. So he's at he was at two hundred five. He was humongous, and I'm like, I don't know, man. Like, let's let's you know, like again, freaking short arms. So we had him at one fifty five, man. Three weeks, fifty freaking pounds. Damn. Um, yeah, I. It's uh, a good friend, right? That yep. was his advice. Let's uh, cut like, all the way to lightweight. I'm like, let's try pounds. this. You know, like he's not a client, so if he dies, you know, we're not gonna get sued. <laughs> Uh, but no, man, but in, um, yeah, 50 pounds. And then, um, yeah, so I think, and at the time, did they, did you get IVs? You got, yeah, I got IVs yeah. for the fight. Yeah. That was, I mean, we're talking 10 years ago or something yeah, like that dude. now, but yeah, I mean, it was, it was, I was 200 pounds walking in the cage. Dude, you look like baby Godzilla. Like the thing is like, we've been baby. training, dude, he training like, you know, every man stuff like that. He just picked that kid up and just like flinging him around. Like kids like, I'm going to get up. No, you're not. Boom. Just like. You know, that's did that for three rounds, so it was. He, uh, he basically put fifty pounds back on. Yeah. So it, he, he, what did you, what did you weigh starting, and then what did you weigh on the scale, and what did you weigh when you fought? Um. So starting out, like, I, so we started the diet to diet down like three weeks out. Um. But I mean, probably the cut was. I don't know if, even know if you remember, but it was probably. I remember looking at numbers and wondering how the hell we we're going to make yeah, it Yeah, I don't know. I mean, probably starting out, the cut was 35 pounds, I don't know, fluid, something like that. Yeah. And, you know, gl- glycogen, fluid, and, and, right. and uh, I, I weighed in at uh, 156 and then fought the next day at, like, 200, 199, Holy 200. Shit. Yeah. It's a world record right there. If was... I felt bad for the guy I fought, yeah. It was bad. He was, like, 160 pounds. He probably cut five pounds. So when we fought, I was... <laughs> Probably thought you guys paid off the refs or right, something. Right? Yeah, right. I mean, it was, um, it was no, a mismatch, I think. Yeah, but it was good, man. You know, I would never recommend that to anybody. No, we know, learned just from our that. friends. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We <laughs> you just did it with your friends. That was early in the in the the start of this thing, so we just tested everything on ourselves, and I was the dummy for that one. But it worked. It worked. I won. It was all right. <laughs> <laughs> My wife thought I was cool. Yeah. Hey, I mean, oh man, it's huge. But uh, oh, and my my Instagram is uh, Lockloaded MMA. So that was uh, 
you know, anybody can look me up on there. And if, if people DM me, uh, like for certifications, anybody that DMs me, I'll, I'll actually call them back and actually like vet them. That's how important it is. So I'll vet everybody. They just got to make sure they leave their number, make sure that they, uh, they write out that they, uh, um, want to get certified and we make that happen. They're going to say, how much fruit, how much kefir? Mm-hmm. When do I drink my kefir? Oh, when yeah. do I do this? When do I do yeah, that? I don't know. Is peanut butter good for me? Is peanut be... butter good for me? DMs are going to be flying in. Anything else, Andrew? <laughs> No, that's it. Thank you, guys. That was that was fucking amazing, man. Thanks. Yeah. Strength Thank is guys. never a weakness. We're out of here. Awesome.